Thank you. Welcome to the organizational meeting of the Arlington School <clears throat> Committee. Today is Thursday, April 14th, 2016 at 6.30 p.m. The purpose of this small meeting is to reorganize the committee. One of the joys of this committee is the collegiality that we have in terms of exchanging roles and rotating the chair. Uh, it was an honor to serve as your chair last year. Uh, this was my second round as chair, so I'm now a uh, double has-been in the committee, <laughs> uh, as well as being a has-been at MASC. I've, I've hit the daily triple. But it's great to be with you all. I'm happy to be with my colleagues and ready for another great year of, of work. I'll take a nomination for the election of officer of chair. I nominate Dr. Seuss, Dr. Jennifer Seuss. Second. <clears throat> Any other nominations? Hearing none, motion to close nominations. So moved. All, uh, second. second. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That's a unanimous vote. Uh, motion to elect Dr. Seuss's chair by Mr. Thielman, second by uh, Mr. Hainer. Uh, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That's a unanimous vote. Congratulations, Madam Chair. Now nomination and election of officer vice chair. Move to uh, elect uh, nominate. Mr. Th nominate, excuse me, nominate Mr. Thielman as vice chair of the Arlington School Committee. Second. Okay, moved by Mr. Hainer, second by Dr. Allison Ampey. Any other nominations? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's a unanimous vote. Nomination, election, office of secretary. I nominate Mr. Hainer. Second. Okay, motion by Mr. Thielman, second by Dr. Allison Ampey. Are there, are there any other nominations? Hearing none, all in favor? Aye. 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 Opposed? That's unanimous. Congratulations to our new officers. Vote to approve committee and liaison assignments for 2016-2017 is presented by uh, Dr. Seuss. So move. Moved by Mr. Hainer, second by? Mr. Thielman. Mr. Thielman. <coughs> uh, any debate, discussion? Besides a thank you for a very mm -hmm. lovely placement. Um, all in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? That is unanimous. Vote for unauthorized authorization to sign payroll warrant. Mr. Thielman. So moved. Uh, well, who are you going to authorize? <laughs> the chair. No, no, no. Oh, I, oh Mr. Hainer. <laughs> Mr. Hainer. Okay. Yeah, Mr. Second. Hainer. Okay. Well, you vote to authorize the chair and Mr. Hainer to sign the, uh, okay. the payroll warrant. Uh, any discussion? Second by Dr. Allison Ampey. All in favor say aye. 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 Opposed? Uh, that is a, a unanimous vote. Um, po uh, per policy BDA standards and norms of the Arlington <coughs> School Committee, BDA-E. Uh, will the incoming chair please read them to the committee? I'd be pleased to. We, the Arlington School Committee, acknowledge that a school committee meeting is a meeting of school committee members that is held in public and not a public meeting and that we will make every effort to ensure that meetings are effective and efficient. To that end, we acknowledge the importance of subcommittees, and we and the superintendent agree to utilize them to focus on specific topics in depth and to prepare for presentation, deliberation, and possible action by the school committee. We, the Arlington School Committee, set forth these standards and norms that we will all commit to abide by as individuals and as a committee, represent the needs and interests of all students in the district exercise leadership in vision, planning, and policy making, evaluation and advocacy on behalf of the students and the district, not in managing the day-to-day -day operations of the district. Conduct our business through a set agenda. Emerging items will be addressed in subsequent meetings through agenda items. Provide full disclosure. Each member will provide input, encouragement, express concerns, and positions rather than withhold information from other members. When a committee member feels that there has not been full disclosure, an objective process for revisiting the issue will be used. Five, maintain an open environment where each member is empowered to freely express opinions, concerns, and ideas. Committee members will work together to clarify and restate discussions in order to strive for full understanding. Keep an open mind and accept that they can change their opinions by recognizing that they are not locked into their initial stated positions. Make decisions on information and not on personalities. Committee members will act with the best information available at the time, considering data, the superintendent's recommendations, proposals, and suggestions. Committee members will strive to make the best decision at the time. Debate the issues, not one another. The committee will engage in critical thinking, expecting all committee members to freely offer differing points of views as part of the discussion, 
prior to making a board decision. Not take unilateral action. A committee member's authority is derived only through a majority decision of the committee acting as a whole during an open public meeting. Attend meetings well prepared to discuss issues on the agenda and will, well prepared to make decisions, striving for efficient decision making. Strive to have no surprises for the committee or superintendent. All members will receive the same information on all topics in a timely manner. Strive to reach decisions by consensus. Discuss with respect, disagree without acrimony. When consensus is not possible, all members will publicly abide by the majority decision. Understand and respect the chain of command as it concerns the roles and responsibilities and direct others to do the same. Review and revise our standards and norms as needed as part of the committee's self-evaluation. Uh, this was adopted and approved March 22nd, 2012. And just a, a note, we will be actually looking at these again and seeing if they need to be updated in a, about a month. And I will sign. Thank you. Okay, all members of the committee will sign policy uh, on paper. Uh, BDA E. Um, There's a typo in there. Uh, this is the conclusion of business of the organizational meeting following a motion to adjourn. Uh, we will commence the regular meeting at 6.45. Looking for a motion to adjourn. So moved. By Mr. Hainer, second by Mr. Thielman. All in favor? Aye. Aye. Opposed? Aye. We are adjourned. Welcome. Today is Thursday, April 14th. Um, this is my first uh, time as chair, and I, I look forward to serving everyone. Um, we have a new member, Len Carden, who unfortunately cannot make it today. He um, has a a year ago planned a, a family vacation and uh, was not able to make it. Uh, before we have some exciting stuff to hear, we have the uh, National History Day uh, presentations, which we're really looking forward to hearing. Uh, but I just wanted to talk about some of the art that is in the room that's new first. Uh, so starting from here, uh, this, I think these are all Dallin students. Um, Water Lily painting. Dallin students were inspired by water lily paintings of contemporary artist Lucinda Howe from South Carolina, as well as by French artist Claude Monet. Students worked on both wax resist, resist with tempura paint and glue resist with oil pastels to achieve colorful and playful waterscapes. Uh, so the glue resist paintings, is that the, that's, I think those are those. For this glue resist painting technique, Dallin students were inspired by the work of Australian ar Aboriginal artist Daniel Boyd. Boyd is a contemporary artist from Sydney, Australia, who uses oils, pastels, and archival glue to create large, colorful images. His mixed media paintings often have black or dark backgrounds upon which the applied colors appear bold and striking. Probably that. No, I think that's, that's a water lily. Um, Japanese sumai brush painting. Dallin artists were excited to use traditional Japanese brushes made of bamboo and goat hair to paint scenes of nature. The students were inspired while watching several videos on YouTube of contemporary artist Sensa Rebecca Rocca. Rebecca Rocca, who lives in Spain, studies the traditional art of sumai -e brush painting and also teaches the Japanese martial arts of Ak Akaido. Now I'm butchering pronunciation, I, I apologize. Um, Objects of nature drawn from observation. Actually, that's that, I think, right? Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Back there. yeah, California based contemporary artist Sean Sullivan was the inspiration for these studies by Dallin students of natural objects drawn with attention to texture, light, and shadow. Sean Sullivan is perhaps best known for his sprawling murals, murals of nature drawn with only a sharpie. The mural titled Grand Pale Maw, created on site at Los Angeles Contemporary exhibitions took him seven months to complete okay and the international dot day painting uh, which apparently is on September 15th down students in grades K through 5 were inspired to take paint in their own unique direction for our student celebration of international dot day this year international dot day takes place every year on September 15th and is a global celebration of creativity courage and collaboration inspired by the book the dot by Massachusetts author and illustrator Peter Reynolds. 
The book challenges readers to make your mark and see where it takes you. Peter Reynolds writes children's books about authentic learning, creativity, and self-expression, and his books have been published in over 20 languages. And I have to say, my kids love that book. <laughs> so, I think, did we get it? Okay. Okay. Um, Should I introduce them? Should I introduce? Um, introduce the history. Yes, I will. Well, actually, so I also want to recognize um, Linda Hansen as our AA rep. Um, so let me introduce the uh, National History Day students. Um, is Alison Santinito here? She can't. Okay, that's too bad. Um, we are excited to hear. I actually don't remember how many how many students do we have here. They will introduce mm -hmm. themselves. Yep. Seven. Okay. So hopefully we we'll get we'll get introductions. Um, so apparently, what I've heard is that whenever Arlington goes to these competitions, they dominate the scene. <laughs> They're just so fabulous and um, and they win awards like crazy. So we're really excited to, to see a, a sampling of the work today. Yes. Um, yeah. I'd like to um, welcome all of you. You did a fantastic job and we are so proud of you. Um, uh, Jason Levy is here tonight mm -hmm. and his co-advisor I don't believe was able to make it, Alice Sansonito. Uh, but they have been advi advisors and there for these students from the very beginning of the year. Uh, they spend, I, I'm sure that they spend hundreds of hours, certainly collectively, uh, on these projects. And uh, you're absolutely right, they're fabulous. They, they dominate, and they dominated the states this year. We had, as I believe, um, 13, is it 13 projects that went to the, to, from the region to the state competition and six projects are going on to nationals, which is a third of all of the projects that were there. So actually, there's probably more statistics about this, and I don't know, uh, Jason, would you like to come up and talk a little bit about this and then introduce your, um, the students that are here tonight? Okay. Um, we had 32 participants in this year's competition at the greater Boston districts. We competed against 14 other schools we had 13 projects advance to states. At states, we had six projects come in first or second place, which is allowing them to compete now in nationals in Washington, D.C. We had three honorable mentions, which means they just missed going to nationals, third or fourth place. We also had one project get a special award for the best Massachusetts history entry. We competed against 25 other middle schools across Massachusetts at the junior, in the junior division, which is grades six through eight. And out of 18 possible projects I can go to nationals, we had six advance. For each category, there is up to 12 projects I will be competing, and only the top two will make it to nationals. These students worked very hard. They started in September. Uh, we had meetings throughout the year. They came before school, after school. We met during the weekends. They gave up all their time to, on the weekends to work on this, and they learned a lot. Most importantly, they enjoyed it. They got to pick topics that they wanted to do, and that shows in their work. Um, I'm going to introduce the first speaker who's participated for three years, and this will be his first year going to nationals, Griffin Gould. Um, I'm Griffin Gould. Um, I have participated in National History Day all three years in my middle school career. Um, and I would like to start off by saying thank you guys for giving us all this uh, exciting opportunity to speak in front of you. And I think I speak for all of us when I say that we're honored to be here. Um, National History Day is a very, it's an incredible program and it's given us all valuable skills that will stay with us for the rest of our lives. And um, we have learned how to research and write a thesis and defend the thesis and conduct interviews and work hard. And I think that working hard is the most valuable skill that we have all learned from National History Day. And it's probably 10 times harder than regular school. Um, our team has always done well in the competitions 
I think we took home, or we sent almost half of the people from our region to states, and 11 other schools compete in regionals, and we took home, we beat the other 10 easily. Um, and we also would like to thank Mr. Levy and Ms. Sansonito for their help and assistance and guidance in this process. And their help is just incredible. We wouldn't be able to do it without them. Um, this is Sagar. Hi, um, I'm Sagar Stogi. I'm in grade seven, and this is my second year participating in National Easter Day. And uh, so we have many project choices that you can do to represent the theme that is for this year, which was Encounter, Exploration, and Exchange. And we have a documentary and websites and research paper exhibit and an original performance. And you can work in groups. And yeah. Um, I'm Lauren Murphy. I'm in eighth grade, and this is my first year participating. Um, so for the research <coughs> process, it starts out in September, and you learn the theme, which was, as Sagar said, exploration, encounter, exchange. And um, then you kind of pick your topic, I guess, around that. I know when I started, um, Mr. Levy and Ms. Sansonito advised me to find a topic that I care about first and then worry about the theme later. And that was actually great advice because um, I think then I kind of found something I was passionate about without worrying about it being, you know, does that fit perfectly and all of that. And um, so then you start your research. Um, I, I know I started more with a broader view. I found um, you kind of just look at anything that might fit and then see where that research takes you, find a focal point. Um, you find access to primary, secondary sources. Um, you can visit museums. I went to the JFK Library for my research. Um, and then from there, I know I didn't come up with my thesis until pretty far along into the research process because it took a while to sift through everything I found and see what I was really trying to prove. Um, and then you can also um, conduct interviews. Um, our advisors encourage it. And um, a lot of our interviews were set up by the students. We learn how to send a proper email to a professor or someone who's an expert on our topic. And we conduct interviews over the phone, over Skype, over email. And it's really great to hear from someone who knows about your topic and can really talk to you about it firsthand. And I conducted a few interviews, too. And I think that was probably one of my best sources in the project. Hi, I'm Grace Walters. I'm in seventh grade, and uh, this is my second year doing National History Day. Um, doing the interviews was a really cool process because, um, first of all, it's so beneficial to have an interview in your project. And I, in fact, did, um, I conducted an interview with Paul Brynus, who was a former Freedom Rider during, during 1961. And um, it was funny because when we were looking for interviews, we were emailing so many people, about, I think, like 10 people um, just looking for interviews, and we got no responses. And it was funny because um, when we were in the media center, um, Mr. Conklin, one of the assistant teachers at Audison, approached us and said, um, I actually know a Freedom Rider, and I could totally set you up, uh, set, set you up with him. So, um, so it was great because we got to meet him, and we got about an hour and a half interview with him. Um, and he was just such a he was so beneficial to our project, and he was so articulate, and um, he was just like a fascinating person, and it was such an honor to meet him and um, get to know his experiences on the Freedom Rides during 1961. Mm -hmm. um, and so many other really amazing interviews were conducted, um, and we found them just, uh, you know, from looking, kind of trying to stalk people on Google, and also just um, writing formal emails. Um, so yeah, those were the... Um, I interviewed um, Barnaby Milne, and he is the great grandson of the person who I chose as my topic. And his interview was very helpful because he gave me quotes. And um, actually, on my website, there's this whole 
long list of about a thousand plants that was very beneficial to my to helping me prove my thesis um, and I got that from him and it was really fascinating to meet him because he's not only an expert on my topic um, but also he's a great um, civil rights activist in Britain especially for um, for uh, history and he he's on I think the um, education board of England and that was it was really incredible to know um, that someone who had achieved that high level was helping me with my project um, so um, my topic was about um, gender equality or this amendment that was passed to improve gender equality in US aid recipient countries. So um, I interviewed um, Professor Goodkind who is a um, professor at the University of Pittsburgh and um, she also founded this um, program which um, still, what's the word, um, it helped the implementation of the amendment and continues its legacy today and she founded it and it's still going on and I just happened to read about her in an article and I found her email and you know I reached out I didn't think there was a very good chance she'd get back to me but she did and she was so nice and I learned so much about the organization because of her and then I also interviewed um, Ambassador Block the former ambassador to Nepal and she worked under the senator who passed the amendment during the time it was passed and she her interview was probably my best source throughout my entire project um, it was over the phone and she kind of just tied all of my research together. She told me, you know, about the effects that it had immediately, how it was received, and I think without these interviews my project would not have been as successful as it was. So it's just amazing that we had this opportunity to conduct them. Um, hi, my name's Allie DeFrancisco and I'm in seventh grade. This is my second year participating in National History Day. Um, I'm Helen Bernardi. This is also my second year participating in National History Day, and we did our project on the Brothers Grimm. Uh, they wrote a lot of the modern day stories that we love today. We interviewed a Harvard professor named Maria Tatar, and she is um, she teaches folk German folklore and German literary stories. Um, so when we interviewed her, we um, we tried we asked if it was okay to record her because especially in the exhibit you wanna um, you wanna like maybe type out some of their words and put them on your board and we also had a video that had a few of our favorite clips but um, it was she she was just really personally connected with the Brothers Grimm and their original stories. Um, we also made sure that our interview kind of flowed like a conversation. You don't really want it to be question answer because it's kind of feels more friendly when you're talking to them, kind of just like you're having a regular conversation, not for something as important as this. But she was very helpful with what she told us, and it was definitely one of the best sources we had in our project. <coughs> Um, hello, my name is Connor Rempe. I am in seventh grade and this is my second year doing National History Day. I'm, I was Saga's partner this year. Uh, so we conducted an interview of three, our topic first off, was the Lost Boys of Sudan, a uh, group of refugees who uh, had to travel across Su uh, Sudan at the time, which is now South Sudan, and are now residing in the United States after a genocide that killed most of their families. And so for our interviews, we had three. We had um, an interview with three Lost Boys, which helped us a lot. We had Moses Ajo, Peter Chambang, and Jacob Dang. Who are all, who are, all live in Arlington, and um, one even Jacob went here at, to Arlington High uh, mm -hmm. when he first migrated here. Um, and we interviewed them at the Sunnis Enrichment for Families program in Malden, which is a center where uh, children of Sunnis refugees can come and get extra help 
for, with their schoolwork and meet other children with the same situation as them. Um, it really added a lot to our project because who can really say that they were that they knew what happened to these boys like so it gave us a real pers like a sense of reality to our project because we couldn't really understand without them what really our uh, the boys went through so it was extremely valuable. Um, so we had 13 groups that went to the state competition on April 9th, and then two teams also got honorable mentions at the district level, which is just Greater Boston. Um, and then six projects, um, me, Lauren, um, Connor, and Sager, you got, no, um, and then three, four other people who aren't here. Um, and we had four first place finishers and two second place finishers and three honorable mentions. And that's just incredible for one school. And we were, I was surprised and I was, I was so happy that our school had done so well and that we had all been able to participate. Um, and we got one special award for the best project on Massachusetts history. And uh, that's really cool because the special awards are really they're sort of fun and interesting. Do you want So yeah, uh, we covered the Lost Boys of Sudan, as I said before. Uh, we, so we started off conducting our research on how, or like just what the Sudanese Civil War was, um, really, because we had no prior knowledge of that, and that's a good basis to start off on. Um, so we, that was one of the things that we asked the people the person that we did our, one of the people that we did our interviews with, and we understood how like it made us understand how much their lives were just ruined after their after this genocide because they I mean here hold on let me play this this guy was one of the people we interviewed so. oh okay I guess it won't work but sorry uh, yeah so. It was basically just an interview showing how um, we just asked him how he how like how life was before the war before the Sudanese Civil War happened and it, he just explained how great their life was and how he couldn't have changed it for anything and on the next page. So yeah, once again, this is all just the Civil War. Um, background of the, I mean, this is just a lot of dense information that I really don't have time to go over right now, but, um, <laughs> so, yeah, basically, terrible genocide, and, uh, so South Northern Sudan was going to switch, uh, switch to, uh, Islamic law, and Southern Sudan, who is culturally closer to uh, South Africa, Southern Africa, um, didn't really, which is mostly like animist beliefs, uh, didn't believe that religion should play such a large role. So, yeah. yeah. Can I show one more? Yeah, just, yeah, yeah, this is our research. This took a while to put together, so um, it's all of our sources, mm -hmm. and uh, easily the most valuable is the interviews, but. Um, so, yeah, we. Oh. Yeah. Wow. <laughs> it's a long wow. list. Wow. Okay, so <laughs> is that, I guess that's all? We're getting the signal? Okay. Our 
exhibit ch our project choice our project cho choice was an exhibit and this is it um, we chose an exhibit because it we felt like that since our um, the Brothers Grimm kind of revolve around stories. It was the best way to present our information. It was very visual and interactive, and that's what we like about it. Um, at the competition, we also had a display set up um, below. This was actually put up on a table, so you could kind of, it's high and you can see everything. Um, but it's, yeah, like Ali said, it kind of shows a mix of your information and pictures, like we have some comparison of um, some modern tales and um, some of the originals, and it's easier just to show comparison and, um, yeah. So um, that's, the picture on the left is our table presentation part. We used a lot of books for our sources. One of them was in German, an original German book with their original tales in it. And this is actually our board from states. That's our board from regionals. We got first place in regionals, but we took some of the judges' feedback and revised it for the state's competition. Um, the white on the picture on the left, the white um, kind of frames, that was our typed up interview. We obviously didn't use um, all of the parts of the interview because it wasn't really connected to our theme of our project, but there were definitely some parts that we really liked and that's why we put them on a table. At the state competition, we also had a um, iPad with a video iMovie playing of some of the, our favorite parts. Um, this is my project. I did an individual documentary, and I'll just show you the beginning of it. There are a lot of women in this country who feel that like they're being pushed around, and they become very vocal. They call themselves the women's liberation movement. As America entered the 1960s, a societal shift was occurring. More and more women had entered the workforce and were facing many inequalities in the office, from unequal pay to sexual harassment. Women's activists throughout America staged protests for the Equal Rights Amendment, which stated that women could not be discriminated against based on their gender. As women argued for their rights all over the country, it became apparent that gender disparity was a problem in economic development worldwide. In the 1970s, data and studies reported that in parts of Africa, women account for a mere 5% of the workforce. In reality, these women produce 80% of the continent's food supply. But because they work unpaid and unofficially, they are unaccounted for in studies and censuses. Outside aid organizations were under the impression that the men were doing the vast majority of the labor in these developing countries, and therefore their projects and resources were all directed towards men. In the developing world, the women have as much to do with agriculture and farm labor, even more so than men. Amidst the atmosphere of the women's rights movement, Senator Charles Percy of Illinois recognized that the issue of women in the labor force spread much further than America. He will pass an amendment forever changing the United States foreign development programs, improving gender equality and women's rights throughout the world. The Percy Amendment, exploring gender equality through the establishment of nonprofit organizations. In 1973, the young senator sponsored the Percy Amendment to the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961 requiring that women benefit equally from all United States foreign assistance projects. The Percy Amendment stated that U.S. bilateral assistance programs must be administered so as to give particular attention to those programs, projects, and activities 
which tend to integrate women into the national economies of developing countries, thus improving their status and assisting the total development effort. Senator Percy is quoted saying, at the same time as we seek to achieve the equal rights of women in our own countries, let us adopt this amendment to promote the achievement of equal rights for women in aid recipient countries. The Percy Amendment to the Foreign Assistance Act of 1961 sparked the creation of foreign assistance projects with the primary goal of empowering women to become strong, independent leaders. Team, black and white activists. Core recruited a group of 13 black and white activists of varying ages to travel on commercial buses and intentionally violate the laws and customs of the Deep South. This would involve sitting in random seats next to anyone, regardless of race. At the stations, the riders were to ignore white and colored signs that indicated public facilities. It was a simple yet dangerous plan of challenging Southern customs. Before they departed on their route through the Deep South, the recruits trained with Corps in Washington, D.C. The purpose of the training was to prepare the riders for racially motivated hate or harassment provided by segregationists. They learned how to act in a situation where one or multiple segregationists were being confronted with a violation of the law the writers would observe their reaction. I didn't realize it, but I was, in effect, exploring what was on the other side of the racial divide that I had grown up with. It was like crossing the border. It was into the South. When I went from Manhattan to Nashville to the SNCC office for four days of training, which is after I went to the Congress of Racial Equality and I said, oh, they interview, can you go to jail for an indeterminate period of time? Yes. Can you control your anger? Yes. I think I can. And they said, fine. I mean, that was all. It was like very low key, low level, low budget. And they said, get a, get a bus and go to this address in Nashville, Tennessee. And don't take a cab. Because if you tell the cab driver who will be white that you want to go to that address, you'll never get there. Um, so we would just like to talk about how incredible NHD is as a club. Um, it helps us learn so many skills, like I said before. Um, it helps us work harder. It helps us do more work, which is nice. Um, and it just builds a sense of team and friendship between us. And that's really nice. And I know that everyone is really excited 
for what's next and for the future of NHD. Thank you. That was fabulous. Do anyone comments, questions? Well, it was a fabulous presentation, and uh, <clears throat> everyone should be congratulated on your hard work. I'm impressed by the literature you read, the uh, references, the research. I mean, I don't know about kind of about 40 uh, sources there. So that's uh, it's a lot more sources than I looked at in middle school. So congratulations. <laughs> Mr. Hainer. I agree with that. I, can, I can't imagine any of my graduate papers in college having that many resources, and the quality of your resources were fantastic. I envy you what you've gone through. Great job. Dr. Alice Nampi. Yes. Congratulations, and I echo what Mr. Thielman and Mr. Hainer said, and I wonder, where is Nationals? Where are you going? Uh, Washington, D.C. Cool. Mm -hmm. And I just have a, f oh, oh, sorry. I Mr. just want Slipman. to say that this is a stunning presentation very high level and I'm looking at the video said so Ken Burns could have presented that and <laughs> that was done by our kids here in Arlington it's, it's fantastic mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mr. Hayner? I just want to add one more thing uh, you did a great job but I think a uh, part of it was the inspiration of your teachers and congratulations to them too <laughs> <laughs> Thank you very much. So if someone was interested in hearing more about National History Day, where would they go? NHD.org. NHD.org. Okay, great. Thank you so much for sharing your time and your passion. I'm really excited. Um, can I have a quick question? What was the project that won the Massachusetts history? It was the Lowell Mill Girls. It was a group oh. document. Group documentary. There were a number of categories. There was the web, the documentaries, the poster performance, mm -hmm. and research paper. Yes. Well, we're all very proud of you, and we wish you great success in DC and uh, bringing home national awards. Yeah. And <laughs> what won't be seen tonight, I think that's really very, very possible. Likely. Yeah. Very likely. Yeah. So thank you very much. Can I just add that we saw a great deal of technology today, and um, I need to thank the Arlington <laughs> Educational Foundation for their support <coughs> in our increase of technology at the middle school. So thanks to okay. them. Thank you. Okay, so uh, just actually a note of our, about our structure. So um, we wanted to make sure that the kids who are presenting here tonight weren't up too late. We also have teachers who need to get up early, and so we've moved the public participation till later. So some, it was on the agenda, but just to sort of note about what's happening. Public participation usually happens at the beginning. We're pushing it to 745. All right, so next up, sorry. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, next up, we are hearing a presentation on uh, middle school options uh, by Jack Flood and company. Um, as of tonight, we're hearing perspective from teachers. Um, we also have future opportunities to hear from the community. We want to hear from each other. Uh, we have a truncated schedule. I just want to uh, inform the audience at home that there was some talk recently, it's not been finalized, of having a debt exclusion vote on June 11th, one of component of which would be a solution to the middle school. Um, so because of this sort of truncated timing, we are going to have a lot of discussions and we are going to try to get everything in at one, <laughs> you know, very, very quickly. It's, it's, it's going to be a challenge. Uh, we're very pleased that the um, teachers and administrators are sharing their perspective with us tonight. Hey, well, I'll let them introdu introduce themselves. They've prepared a, um, a PowerPoint for you, but this actually goes back to, a, to a, a process that they've gone through at the middle school to really look at this issue very carefully. And, and welcome to all of you, and thank you very much for the work you've done on preparing this um, PowerPoint and just the, the, for all of your participation in this important decision that's facing all of us in this community. So um, that microphone there is something that everybody needs to pass along so that, that 
people watching this evening can hear what you have to say. Does it slide? Okay. All right. Jack, you want to introduce everybody or have them introduce themselves? Sure. I'll start off first. Um, I'm Jack Flood. I'm one of the assistant principals up at the Audison Middle School. And uh, as you see with me here tonight is a, is a whole host of, of members from the Audison teaching staff. So uh, before I just start, before I start off with an introduction, I'll pass one real quick. So Good evening. I'm Jenna Fernandes. I'm a sixth grade English language arts teacher. I'm Juliana Keys. I am an eighth grade history teacher, and I'm one of the AEA building reps at the Audison. I'm Randy Flynn. I'm a special education teacher at the Audison. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm Heather Mahoney. I'm one of the sixth grade English language arts teachers at the Audison. It's hard to beat them. <laughs> We're fantastic. In any case, uh, we're here tonight to present to you uh, the findings from a, from, a, uh, from a survey and a discussion that took place amongst the Audison staff in regards to the space challenges, the enrollment challenges, I should say, that the Audison is going to be experiencing in the years to come. Currently, our enrollment is at 1,143 students, with those numbers expected to rise up to into, up into 1,500 in the years to come. On March 8th, Dr. Bodie visited the Audison Middle School and provided a presentation to Audison staff around the enrollment challenges that the school is facing and provided the staff with an explanation of three different options that the district was entertaining um, as a means of, of, of accommodating that increased enrollment. Those three options were renovation of the Gibbs, and converting the school into a sixth grade model. The second option was renovating the Gibbs and um, basically um, and turning the school into a six, seven, eight model. And the third option was the expansion of the existing Audison Middle School as we know it today. <coughs> so after, after Dr. Bodie uh, had her presentation and uh, explained the options to staff, uh, staff broke off into mixed disciplinary groups and they engaged in discussions around the three options. These discussions were, were guided in nature and they were led by, th by three discussion prompts, which I'll read to you. Uh, the first discussion prompt was, which of the three proposed models is the most supportive of a school culture and climate that is conducive to teaching, learning, and meeting the social and emotional needs of our students and why? The second prompt was which of the three proposed models best supports high quality instruction that promotes creativity, innovation, creative thinking, problem solving, and communication and collaboration, and why? And the third of which was which of the three proposed models is most effective at facilitating staff collegiality and healthy par parent involvement, and why? So teachers broke off into these multidisciplinary groups, and the whole rationale behind this was for um, myself and, and Dr. Bodie and, and members of the district leadership to be able to kind of um, to, to acquire an understanding of how teachers felt collectively as a whole as opposed to just teachers as individuals. And as you'll see when we move forward into the presentation, those findings will be revealed as we move forward. Um, following the group discussions, uh, the feedback forms were gathered and that data was all organized and categorized and so that it could be prepared for further analysis and put into report form, which all of you have received tonight. Um, shortly after the group discussions, individual group uh, Google surveys <coughs> were sent out to individual staff members in the building so that they could share how they felt as individual teachers in regards to the increasing enrollment and the space changes and space options that were, that were put before them. That data was all gathered. It was, it was uh, organized, categorized, and basically the teachers worked very hard. They took a, lo a lot of the data that I provided with them and they put it in report form um, and put together this PowerPoint presentation <coughs> to you tonight. And so they're here tonight to share what their findings are from the, uh, pr from the perspective of the teachers in the building and what they think is in the best interests of uh, healthy 
learning environment for students and a healthy teaching environment for the teachers in the building. So at this point, what I'll do is I'll turn it over to Julie Keys, and she will start the presentation. Thank you. one of these for my classroom that's great um, so I just want to start you off with kind of where we are as a school um, we all recognize that Audison is nearly the double recommended size for middle school which is about six eight hundred students um, that puts us as the fifth or sixth largest in the state um, I've seen both numbers depending on which survey I'm looking at um, projected to possibly be number one if the enrollment numbers continue the way they're projected to um, and we're really over our building capacity as is, and I think you know that. Um, we're at the point where we have to seriously consider whether we can even have full school assemblies because it's just too many, it's not safe. We don't have a safe place to gather 1,200 people or more. Um, the, the gym is fully scheduled, the cafeteria is crowded, it's hard to get that many kids through the lunch line in one block of lunch. Um, we're looking at teachers having to share classrooms, which means teachers having to keep their materials on carts, which limits how you're able to teach when you know you have limited supplies. Um, as well as sort of we're already stressing our infrastructure. We've had plumbing issues this year. We've had heating issues. We've had, you know, our kitchen can only cook for so many kids. I mean, there's a lot of issues going on here that a big school is going to have. Um, and we're seeing the shakedown and affect our students. I think all of us can tell you that we don't have the relationship with students that we used to have, and we miss that. Um, and that larger class size means there's less one-on-one -on -one time for kids. Uh, I can tell you just in a class of 26 compared to a class to 18, even little things like the time it takes to check homework, I have more time for the kids in that class of 18. We get a lot more done. Um, there's more instances of bullying and misbehavior in the hallways because they're so crowded. And even little things like just kids bumping into each other mm -hmm. that's perceived as bullying or um, you know, just leads to escalations of things that wouldn't happen if there weren't as many kids. And the time it takes to get around the building. You know, it, when there's that many kids in the hallway, the traffic moves slower um, and there's only so much time between classes. So you know, we're, we're stressed with the number of kids that we have in our building today. So that's where we are. Um, we all filled out um, the survey Jack sent, and then we took that data and broke it down by grade level or discipline to kind of see how the different groups were responding, and that's what we have here for you tonight. Um, so the first group we looked at was the sixth grade teachers because they are potentially most affected by these changes. Um, oh. Well, what we've been doing, yep, we just did that, okay. So yeah, we had our, we've had following reports that you guys have been putting out from your meetings, from the building task force meetings in, in town, um, lunchtime and hallway conversations, faculty meeting presentation with Dr. Bodie, the individual survey, and then a group of sixth grade teachers, um, out of cluster teachers, special ed teacher and administrators did go visit the High Rock School in Needham, which is a grade six only school, just to sort of see what that was like and ask questions. Um, and then information about that was shared out. People were able to contribute questions ahead of time, and then the answers to those plus more information was shared out afterwards, so. Um, so in terms of our survey, the sixth grade teachers' responses, um, you'll see in all of these, the red section of the pie chart are preferences for um, renovating the Gibbs to house a single school. The yellow section is renovating the Gibbs to house a smaller 678 school. And the blue section is people who, op who said their first choice would be to build on to the Audison. Um, so most of the sixth grade teachers, 71.4% responded that they would like to try the sixth grade school model. Um, so they supported renovating the Gibbs. They really cited ideas about tailoring that for sixth grade students, that they really liked that idea. Um, and the opportunity to maybe have more in cluster time with kids, more flexible schedule, um, smaller clusters that those kids really need. Um, and then, you know, some of the concerns they put about the other ideas were that, and you'll see the, a lot of these answers come up depend, for, across grades. You know, concerns about two schools being sep is separate but equal is that, it, will it really be equal? Um, comparing and contrasting between the two schools. Um, and just fears that the Audison's so big, the idea of making us bigger 
um, would have too many issues. The, the loss of outdoor space was a big problem. Um, so we have some sixth grade teachers here. If you guys wanted to ask questions about those results, or if you want to save them to the end, I don't. <laughs> you want to? Yeah. But you want to ask questions, or oh. let's let's we'll save it to the end. Okay, okay. sounds great. All right. Um, so then we lumped our seventh and eighth grade teachers together here, um, and you can see the colors are the same all the way through. Um, the reasons are pretty much the same um, for these responses, but both groups preferred the idea of a sixth grade school at the Gibbs. Um, nobody in the seventh grade liked the idea of expanding the Audison. I found that interesting. Um, and then when we looked at the out-of-cluster teachers, this was our biggest group of responses. Um, there were 30 out-of-cluster teachers who replied, and that in, that's a big category. That includes, um, yeah, world languages, art, music, PE, tech, facts, um, reading, math support. Um, so there's a lot of variety here, and again, that the responders said that they're um, really preferred the idea of a sixth grade school. Um, and you can see some of the reasons up there. So then what was really surprising to me um, when we went through this was we got, when we broke out the special education teachers' responses, and you'll notice that one looks different. Um, and that our special education teachers um, were the only group in the school who responded with that they would prefer a six, seven, eight. And I, I'm gonna let Randy Flynn talk about that. She's one of our, our SLC teachers at the Audison. Um, and she brought up a lot of points that I hadn't thought of, so I think it's important that everybody hear them. <laughs> um, so one Excuse of- Excuse me, would you define SLC? Uh, uh, go ahead. It's a um, supported learning center. Okay. Um, so the kids kind of, they get more of a therapeutic approach to their, their whole day. Um, a lot of these students struggle with transitions, with anxiety, with making connections socially and with adults. So a lot of the reasoning behind the wanting the six, seven, eight is that to have two transitions so close together is really difficult for a student like that. Um, also, another thing is the programs, right now we currently have um, a behavioral program, an, an autism program, a low cognitive program, um, co-taught inclusion, and all of those also need to be represented at the sixth grade level, and the, but the problem then comes, say you only have one student in that program coming up that year, do you have a whole teacher there, or like how do you work with that? So that was another, um, thing that was concerning to them. Um, and also the social work perspective. Um, our social workers currently, at least in the programs, the SLCs, they spend a lot of time in the classrooms really getting to know these students and working with them for the three years. And some students re receive individual therapies with these social workers. So it's really hard to develop that relationship in one year, whereas when they have the three years, they're more trusting and open and they can get to a lot more of their struggles and work on them with strategies and things like that. So that was really, yeah. really it for that. So important stuff to consider, mm -hmm. absolutely, when we're looking at these models. Um, and yeah, uh, so, um, so in total, sort of taking the big picture look and looking at the majority opinion here, it seems that the majority of teachers do not want Audison to be expanded. So we, we would respectfully ask anybody who's in charge of decision making to please take that off the table. <laughs> um, we are big and it's not in the best interest of our students to get bigger and that's really what this is about. Mm -hmm. um, overall, the Gibbs, the, if we're going to renovate the Gibbs and open that as a new school building, the preference of teachers seem to lean towards a grade six school, but with some very serious concerns that would have to be addressed, specifically about the special ed issue and how that was gonna be done. Um, and some of those questions were sort of addressed with the visit to the High Rock School in Needham, but there were some other flags that were raised at the same time. So we're really looking, you know, we know this is very early in the process, um, but you know, ours, as our recommendation, it seems to be grade six school, but we have to figure this stuff out before the building opens, 
if that's the way it's going to go. Um, and the big flag there is that if we're going to go with a grade six school, it needs to be a grade six school, not a mini Audison. Um, what, what did you say about the sixth graders? It was little people in. Oh. oh. <laughs> um, our, you know, I've only been in Audison eight years, and in that short time, what the sixth grade schedule has looked like has changed tremendously. Where we used to be pretty different from what seventh and eighth graders were going through, and as enrollment has increased and budgets and the schedule has gotten more and more in line with what seventh and eighth graders do, mm -hmm. and the kids are just so different. Yeah. Um, and so, in the element, I've, been, I've visited a lot of fifth grade classrooms, and it's such a different experience from when you know we have a high school with little people. It that, feels yeah. like. The high school with little people. And that's, we don't want that. We want to you know, have a developmentally appropriate programming for our kids. Um, and so you know, we sh if we're going to open this as a sixth grade school, it should be with the idea that we're going to have smaller clusters. We're going to have more flexible time. In, in, you know, the idea that all the kids can be in cluster at the same time. Whereas right now, the sixth grade always has one group who's out in an exploratory class. So they never have like all of their 115 kids at the same time. Um, and that sixth grade teachers should drive the change. I was told that that was too forceful of language. Um, mm -hmm. They should be very involved and be able to give lots of input in the change um, from the beginning. So, um, so that, that's our recommendation. Um, I just want to let, you know, not to end on a negative note, but we do want to keep these things in mind, uh, the special ed programming especially, that if, if we're going to do a sixth grade school, it needs to have all the programs that we have at the elementary level and at the Audison. Um, for a wide variety of reasons. Um, and we need to look at that transition piece very consider carefully. Um, we need to look at how this is going to impact um, exploratory course offerings, um, extracurricular programming, um, and staff. You know, if people are going to have to be transferred, how is that going to be handled? Everybody said ask for volunteers first um, in the survey. Um, the double transitions, uh, making sure resources are distributed evenly between the schools, which I, I we're, we're saying make sure that happens. We have faith that you would make sure that happened. Um, and then the, the other flag that did come up is that requiring teachers to commute back and forth between the Audison and the Gibbs would be very challenging if we were going to have two, and that that should be um, minimized as much as possible. And I think that that also goes to the idea of this is a sixth grade school, we should have teachers who specialize in sixth grade students. So, okay. Do you have more? Well, listen, I think, um, as you can see, uh, Dave to put together this presentation, as well as the, uh, the report that's been submitted to all of you, um, is, is pretty rich in nature. It, it comes from the qualitative standpoint as a result of the group discussions that took place and the, and, and the mixed disciplinary uh, conversations that took place after uh, Dr. Bodie visited the school, as well as uh, followed up with the, uh, with the individual survey, which kind of gave us a little more of a, a quantitative approach. And what you saw tonight in this presentation was kind of a, was, was kind of a blending of all that information together into one PowerPoint presentation. And as I said a moment ago, um, the specifics of all of this can be found in the report that was provided to all of you as well. Uh, I want to thank the teachers. I think the teachers did a fantastic job in putting this all together. Um, it really shows that, uh, I mean, it really was a collaborative effort between the teachers, the administration, uh, the district, Dr. Bodie, wanted to make sure that the teachers were part of this process. Um, and I think it's, uh, that in itself speaks a lot. Regardless of what decision is made, um, you know, especially we look at what the what the Audison as a whole really seems to be leaning towards right now, that being the, the sixth grade model at the Gibbs. Um, one thing that we do have to consider, and we learned this from um, the visit at High Rock the other day, is that the school simply can't be, as Julie alluded to, um, just kind of a, a, a kind of a, a holding tank for the sixth grade students. In other words, that that sixth grade model at, that's going to be housed at the Gibbs really has to be unique and tailored to the sixth grade needs. It really has to be a, a special place for the sixth grade students so they can get the most out of that experience. With that said, what that's going to require is really getting out in front of that and providing the professional development to those teachers that are going to be traveling, to, that are going to be working in that building. Um, 
so that they can be best prepared because it really is going to be kind of a it's going to be a different approach into the way they do things every day as teachers in the classroom and the same thing extends to the seventh and eighth grade teachers um, one of the things we learned from Needham is that when um, if you walk around that sixth grade that sixth grade school in Needham you'll see the whole kind of th that th that whole positive culture attitude is is, is permeated throughout the building. They have advisory periods every day and the lessons learned from those advisory blocks are incorporated into their lessons th throughout the day. One of the challenges they face, however, is that when the students go to the seventh and eighth grade years, um, there's almost like it, it's kind of stepping into a little bit of a, a different environment. Uh, so one of the things that I would recommend is in addition to providing professional development to the staff that's going to be working at the sixth grade school, it would also be getting out in front and providing professional development to those seventh and eighth grade teachers so that there can be a continuity between the two schools. Um, but um, other than that, like I said, I, 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 think, uh, I think everybody did a great job. And um, you know, we open this up to any questions or anything that anybody may have. Great, uh, thank you. I just wanted to say a little thing about timing. Uh, so we expect that the School Enrollment Task Force will be making a decision on May 2nd. If the decision is to repurpose Gibbs, then the school committee has to make a decision about which model. If the decision is not to repurpose Gibbs, then it's, we don't have that decision. So just to say something about timing. I'm sure my um, colleagues would like to ask questions and comments. Uh, Mr. Slickman. Yeah, a um, couple things. Uh, one, in terms of, yeah, I, I'm very attuned to the argument of the social workers who need to develop relationships with kids as they're moving up. And I'm wondering if we could take some of the folks and attach them to uh, the, a cohort or a, you know, a class and move them one year in, at the Gibbs and two years at the Otis and then rotate back to pick up a new class. Is, the, is that model something that we could potentially do? I thought that too. Mm -hmm. But then I said, you're putting the cart before the horse. Mm -hmm. So I stopped thinking that. But um, <laughs> we were actually just talking about that yeah. dinner, so. Yeah, um, you could potentially do that. But again, the double transition for mm -hmm. some of these students will be too much. And I know that in districts, once <coughs> in special ed, if we lose a child and they go out of district, mm -hmm. to get them back in district, <coughs> the next year for a seventh, eighth school, mm -hmm. if we have a good program and something that they'll be really mm -hmm. successful at, it, the likelihood of us getting them back is really low. Mm -hmm. And that it's a lot of money to send a student out of district just because we have that one year mm -hmm. that might not work for them. Did, did you guys go to High Rock in Needham? No. Yeah. Uh, Mike. Oh, Mike. Mm. Mike. Uh, Mike. Oh, sorry. <laughs> yeah, so I was saying it was um, f from from the administrative ranks. It was myself um, and Maury Murphy were there as well as Dr. Bodie and uh, Mr. Hayner also joined us for the visit as well as uh, as well as several teachers. I guess uh, you're going to have to represent the professional staff here. Uh, w were there things that surprised you or opened your eyes that you didn't expect in, in Needham? Yeah, I mean, um, the one thing that, that jumped out at me when, you know, when you walked in the building is basically uh, some, what, I, what I alluded to earlier was, uh, was that whole thing about, you know, the, the, the culture of the building when you walked around. Um, it was very positive in nature. Um, you could tell after it, it's, it was something that you could, you could feel as you made around the building. There was constant reminders around the school's mission, around the school's values, everywhere that you went. When you talk to the teachers in the classroom, um, the teachers were, were also part of making sure that that culture, you know, kind of stayed in, stayed in existence. And um, just walking around and, you know, and seeing the students moving about from class to class, um, it, was, it, was, it seemed like a very orderly environment, and it seemed like the, the students were, really enjoyed the experience. We also had the opportunity to, during the lunch period, to uh, sit down and talk to different groups of students to see how they felt about the whole thing. And uh, they seemed to really love the experience. Um, it, it allows them to kind of grow a stronger relationship with their peers without having that additional anxiety of seventh and eighth grade class students on top of them. Because many of which, like in Arlington, where they're coming from mm -hmm. seven elementary schools, in Needham they're coming from five. Mm -hmm. And so it really gave them that kind of additional year to kind of polish up some of those, uh, some, some, of those some of those things that are needed for, for sixth grade students. And um, so, you know, 
overall, it seemed like a it seemed like a, a very pleasant place for, for 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 students to learn and for for teachers to teach in. Um, but you know, I just want to um, say that this has been such a persuasive report, and I agree with you that we should take the expanded Odyssey off the table. Uh, I just don't see it as a viable option. I think uh, on such a postage, sta uh, postage stamp sized lot to try to cram in the largest middle school in the state, and, and that's what it would be, uh, just is not feasible at all. And so looking down, and, and the teachers agree, and, and I understand that because I, I don't think I'd want to work in that environment. And I think that the argument, you know, there are reasons to go for the two different models, and I do think you're six at Gibbs, seven, eight at Odison is also a very persuasive argument. And I thank you for doing the research and presenting such a good, thoughtful package of data for us to consider. Okay, uh, Mr. Thielman. I wanted to follow up on uh, mm -hmm. Mr. Schlickman's question about the supported learning community uh, issue. <clears throat> if the SLCs, if, if we went to a sixth grade at the Odison, Mm -hmm. I mean at the Gibbs, sixth grade at the Gibbs, and seven and eight at the Addison. How would it look if the entire, all, all three SLCs remained at the, uh, at the Addison, including the sixth grade SLC? I mean, well, I think that they're creating a disconnect between those sixth grade students. They wouldn't be with their class. And just because they're in a supported learning center doesn't mean they're not accessing the general curriculum. Right now, I currently have some students who go out to general ed for history and science, and that wouldn't be an option for them if they were at the seventh and eighth grade school, unless they were gonna go to a seventh grade class, but that wouldn't really be appropriate for them. Mm -hmm. So yeah. I don't think that that would really work. Okay, thank you. Mm -hmm. uh, Mr. Hainer. Uh, first off, I'd like to say a week and a half ago, I was all for uh, six, seven, and eight, two, two campuses. Uh, then I heard the preliminary thing that Mr. Flood gave us, and I was leaning towards just the sixth grade. And after the trip to High Rock, I'm converted. The issue that you brought up about the SLC and special education was a factor that the High Rock and Needham is dealing, continuing to deal with. Mm -hmm. uh, it, initially, it was kept separate, just as you said, but mm -hmm. then the population shifted and stuff, and they developed programs there. The biggest thing, is, my issue at the beginning was uh, the transitions, the added transition and stuff. What I heard from the High Rock people, and uh, I believe sincerely, is that sixth graders come in and there's a, a need to emulate the older students mm -hmm. and, and to copy, which mm -hmm. can cause issues, can cause anxiety and stress and stuff. But the principal, and I don't remember, it was the other one, assistant principal, that was uh, sharing the she information. She's a social worker. Social worker. Uh, they discovered one day, one turned to the other and said, has we had anybody crying yet at the beginning of school? And they both, it, it was an awareness. They said no. And they hadn't realized that that initial transition, making it in there and the anxiety that was coming there. Uh, that one more year and developing the skills and going forward, the, not only the continuity and the, and the all planning that Mr. Flood was talking about, but they have this commonality with the seventh and eighth grade. They have one PTO and things of that nature. Two separate buildings, and the special needs aspect of it is a challenge to them, and they're continuing to work with it. Uh, yeah. They don't have all the answers. We don't have all the answers, <coughs> but we have to look at it collectively. Thank you. Dr. Alice Ampey? Yeah. Um, I was also one of the ones who was lucky enough to get to go to see High Rock, and I, I also was very, very impressed. Um, they're doing a really wonderful job, and it was neat to get to do the full tour. Um, I was also impressed at the experience of a sixth grade only <coughs> school for the children, both just seeing it and hearing and also talking to the uh, children in the cafeteria. Um, but. I am concerned about what we're hearing about the problems of special ed. And this question is actually more for the full administration, anyone who wants to take it. Um, I would really like to hear more about if we were to do a sixth grade only school at the Gibbs and, and do seven, eight at the Audison, how can we make this 
the best for our students who are either in SLC or, or the different programs? Um, how can we improve it for them? Um, it, I'd really like to soon, um, I'd like to get more information about, I mean, I'd like to hear, I didn't, the, the part of the tour that we were on, I didn't hear that much about how High Rock deals with it and what their, their, um, cause we split into different groups, mm -hmm. um, how High Rock deals with it and how, what they're doing with it. Um, but I'd like us to be thinking about it and perhaps reporting back even as soon as the next school committee meeting. Cause I think this is, th this is a, like a major sticking point. Mm -hmm. Um, and we need more information about it. Um, um so do you want to talk about this? Yeah. yeah. Um, I did ask that question at High Rock because that was something that, that I'm concerned about as well. They actually replicated the program at, at this for the sixth grade. So that when we're talking about incremental costs um, between having a pro having a <coughs> sixth grade there or even a sixth through eight, because it would have been it would have been we might not have to replicate it in a six to six through eight because we don't have a program in every elementary school either. But uh, for the sixth grade, they did replicate it and that was part of the incremental cost. Now, every year that can have a different um, programmatic shape to it because you may not have a sixth grade student in a particular one of the, the programs. So it's one of those costs that would be hard to, uh, you'd have to look at if you completely replicated it, but that may not may or may not be necessary. I don't know, uh, Miss um, Elmer. And Dr. Bodie has asked me to prepare two different scenarios, okay. so we'll be doing that. Um, but as um, Ms. Flynn pointed out, you know the changing nature of the population, you know, from year to year, does present a challenge. The other piece that we would need to figure out is the related service providers. So you know. Classroom teacher, you know, we could say replicate the program, put a classroom teacher there, TAs. What would then also have to be factored in, which really is dependent on individual student IEPs, is those related service providers, OTs, PTs, speech and language, social worker, those individuals, how that would be shared between buildings, would, you know, th those are the things that are going to have to be figured out. In, may have to shift year to year just based on the distribution of students. So I know that concerns about staff having to travel, you know, will be taken yep. into consideration, but those are factors we'll have to. Yep. I should just, I wanna ask a question. So I know that potentially you're going to speak to us on the 12th of May. Mm -hmm. um, if Gibbs were repurposed, would you have a report for us at that time or be able to talk to that? Yeah, you would ask for it. Yeah, I asked. Okay, great. Okay, Dr. Allison. Yeah, I just wanted to follow up. So I wasn't, <coughs> in, obviously I'm interested in the financial aspects, but in this case, I was actually thinking more of the experience, the experience of the students and how can we make, if there's a group of kids who are going to have a hard time with transitions, if we're setting up something where there is going to be more transitions for them, how can we make it better for them? or you know, I'm, I'm looking for how can we improve the experience that the students will be having, not just, I'm not just talking about the program, but, but really how can we make it better for the kids? Um, did you? you yeah, I just, because yeah. um, we did sort of a dry run of this in our leadership team and the, 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 the budget stuff comes up, like we're well aware teachers cost money, mm -hmm. um, but the thing to keep in mind is with the rising number of students in these SLC programs, you're gonna be hiring that teacher anyways, mm -hmm. whether it's for a six, seven, eight school or a six school or an Audison expansion, <coughs> like <clears throat> we're gonna be hiring that person anyways, no matter where they go. So when you say like, oh, we're gonna have to replicate the program, well, we put, another, we put one compass teacher at a Gibbs six only school, or we hire a third compass teacher for the Audison, but we're, mm -hmm. the numbers are showing us we're yep. going to have to have that. Could be. Okay. Anyone? Dr. Allison Abbey? Well, yeah, go ahead. Now I have to remember what else. Oh, I was going to say so, one thing I wanted to mention to this is more for our audience outside that I know there's concern about going, the kids having an extra transition if we were to do a six, grade six only school. And I've been looking at the papers. I know they say that kids' um, achievement decreases after when they have transitions going from elementary to middle school. 
and people kind of infer that then the next transitions are going to be worse. And I just want to point out that the papers, at least that I've seen, haven't talked about why this transition, I mean, why there's a decrease. And some of it could be age related. Some of it could be all these different schools coming in together. And I think we can't um, infer from these papers that taking the same cohort of kids who are all together from one school to the next school is going to give you the same kind of achievement changes or things um, that, that these papers suggest. So I don't think that you can look at um, something like what we're suggesting, bringing everyone in together and then moving them all from here to there to yeah. there is going to have the same. You, you, you don't need to be thinking necessarily that the achievement of them because of um, these extra transitions. But that's not necessarily true for the special education kids, and that, that's what right. I'm concerned uh, about. To be, yeah. to be fair, I, I mean, in some ways, they sometimes are less vulnerable than some, when the kids are coming into sixth grade because they're coming into a small class. They are coming into a very, one teacher in some cases or only two or three versus a student who is transitioning through four, five, six teachers. So. That there is a vulnerability there, but I think that that is individual to the students. Um, and for mm -hmm. some of them, they've been traveling as a cohort. Those who've been in <coughs> a program, you know, in elementary have traveled as a cohort too. So, mm -hmm. you know, I don't necessarily think they're more vulnerable than the other sixth grade students, but it's certainly something that, you know, we, we do address already with that sixth grade, fifth to sixth grade transition pretty <coughs> thoroughly. So we'd be thinking more about that sixth to seventh grade transition. Great, well thank you. I can't emphasize enough how critically important it is to hear from teachers and administrators and to get your perspective. Um, it's a difficult decision to make um, and we absolutely need your voices on the table. Thank and you. thank you for letting us be involved. Because yes, thank you. Th these are our kids. Yes. Like, we love these kids and we want what's best for them. So thank Good. you. Thanks. Okay, so we now turn to um, the Vision 2020 Steering Committee appointment. Oh, I'm sorry, we have public registration. Sorry about that. Do we have, actually? None. We have none. Okay, I'm okay. sorry, I, I misread. Um, so, uh, Vision 2020 Steering Committee appointment. Uh, Scott Lever, is that how? Yeah. It? Yes. And I've had the pleasure of meeting you before and was very impressed with you, and Thanks. I'm glad you'll be part of the process. <laughs> Well, yes. I just yeah. begin this. Um, last year, there was a, a change proposed to town meeting for Vision 2020 in creating a more defined standing committee. And in that process, I, I included in your packet what the, what the uh, uh, vote was for and the language around that. So in the, in the language of appointments to this, the standing committee, the process is, is the superintendent um, brings to the school committee a recommendation for an appointment to that committee. And uh, tonight I'm doing that. And Mr. Uh, Mr. Lieber, Lieber and I have talked, actually we've, we've known each other for several years because um, one of the things that also was a, a new focus for Vision 2020 was to revitalize the, um, the education subcommittee of the committee. And there was a number of people who were involved in, in, in actually uh, motivating that change there. And so we've had some discussions and we've had some recent discussions also on oh, what the role could be. And um, he is prepared tonight to give a little introduction to his background. You have his resume. And uh, the, uh, the hope is tonight that you would uh, approve, the, uh, approve the appointment. Sure. W would you like me to give a little background on myself? And sure. Talk, yeah, talk a little bit? Is mm -hmm. that appropriate? Yeah. Okay. I'll, I'll be quick. I know okay. we're running behind. We're behind. Yeah. Yeah. So, so just quickly about myself. I think you have my resume. Um, in terms of my professional background, I'm a consultant with Gardner Consulting. And I lead the work there around organizational change and strategy and digital strategy, technology. I've been a consultant for about 20 years uh, across various firms. Uh, prior to that, I did a PhD and um, uh, University of Massachusetts as an undergraduate. And also, I'm an Arlington public school product, right? So I attended the, the much discussed Gibbs. Um, also, parents in town of one child, soon to be two. Uh, in the schools and also a taxpayer, uh, a lot of taxpayer, um, uh, like many folks. 
Um, so lots of, lots of interest in this. Um, in terms of what I think the role of Vision 2020 can be, I think Vision 2020 uh, can play a very constructive role, collaborative role with the school committee and the school administration in engaging the community in a dialogue about the vision for the schools and what we want our schools to be and what we want our students to experience. I think we face, and, and you all know very well, a lot of very crucial decisions. The, the Gibbs disc uh, discussion earlier, uh, the high school, um, ongoing conversations and discussions around curriculum and how do we best support our teachers. And um, all too often, uh, I guess my experience is that parents get involved, but they get involved really around issues and, and there can be a lot of excitement, a lot of energy generated, but that's often difficult to sustain. And <clears throat> I really hope that we can use Vision 20 as a, as a mechanism to sustain parent involvement and community involvement in a discussion about what we want the schools to be. Um, I, uh, in particular, um, would hope that in the next year that we can have a dialogue and a series of maybe discussions about the priorities and the, and the values that we have as a community and how they're represented in the vision for the schools. And in particular, um, I would like to see us discuss and begin a dialogue around what it means to be world class. We live in a state and in a town where the expectations are quite high and um, there are, um, I think, many aspects of the schools right now, in, in my view, and, and others would have a similar view, that are truly world class. But, but I think we as a community need to be involved in defining what that means and to discuss really what we want in that. And most importantly, how we, how we achieve it. And really what I hope to get out of that is sustained involvement from the community and from the parents in supporting making that collective vision happen. So um, that's a pretty lofty goal. Um, but I think um, as the school enrollment uh, dis discussions recently have shown to me, there's a lot of parents who are very committed and community members beyond parents who are very committed in having this sustained discussion. And I think Vision 2020 can be um, a tool for that. Great, thank you. Um, can I entertain a Do you have a question? I just or, a question um, for Dr. Yes. Bodie. Is this a, an appointment as our representative or just an appointment on the board? Uh, well, I, I guess it, what I'm asking it's, is, it's, are we going to be interacting as, as, as our representative? I know I can call him as a citizen anytime I want mm -hmm. and have that kind of an input, but I didn't know if it was more formal. Well, that's a very good question. Um, it's, uh, it was a way to have people that were representing different parts of the community that were appointed to the standing committee. Uh, I know that, he, that um, he wants to have very much have a continuous dialogue with the school committee as we go forward and thinking about this, this it's an important question, what is world class? And I, I couldn't agree more, there's much about our school system that is really world class and I think we all have maybe a different interpretation of that. But there are some things as we go forward into an operating override in a few years, are there things that we want to consider having that we don't have? For example, world language in the elementary schools. So, and that's just one of, of several things. So I think that's a, a discussion we wanna have over the next couple of years. And so yes, there would be I communication. Okay, so I, I think that's that. great. So how long is the appointment for? I think it's three years, three isn't years. it? Uh, um, I think it is, yeah. Okay, great. Yeah. Mm -hmm. So potentially, it's, uh, yes, Mr. Thaler. I'm going to move the appointment of yes, Dr. Weber. Yes, great, okay. Uh, do I have a second? second? Second. Okay, so Mr. Thielman moves the motion. Uh, Cindy, Ms. Sarks uh, seconded. Um, all those in favor, uh, sorry. Let me just Discussion ask. on the moment? Yeah, motion? let me just yes. ask a technical question because w under the new bylaw, what, the bylaw changed at town meeting last year, mm -hmm. and this was a good thing mm -hmm. because Prior to that, the standing committee wa were elected officials and people who are meeting to death. And they spun that out to have a steering committee mm -hmm. where elected folks and, uh, could get together and talk things out uh, on occasion. But the day-to-day -day operations, nitty-gritty planning and, and work of putting this thing together is going to be in the hands of people right. like Dr. Le uh, Lever here who is uh, 
has the time and the commitment to go and do this. So this is a, this is, this is a good thing. Good thing yeah. But my question was, is that do we appoint approve or is this the superintendent's appointment? It's my, it's my appointment with your approval. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. So then the motion to approve is appropriate. So, okay. So. Okay. Thank uh, you. Okay. So all those in favor of the motion to approve. Aye. Aye. Um, any opposition? No, it's, it's an unanimous um, approval. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Lever. Um, Dr. Lever, I look forward, look forward we look, all look forward to uh, continual conversation and communication. Yeah. Thanks Great. so much. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, so it turns out that we do have public participation um, overlooked. Um, uh, can I welcome uh, Michael Quinn? So uh, you have three minutes. <laughs> okay. I don't think I'll and need that long. It's our. Um, Policy not to yeah. comment on the presentation, yes. Um, I'm aware of the policy. I'm not sure I'm even in the right room on this, but I figured I'd come here and ask. My name is Michael Quinn, 15 Shawnee Road. I'm the parent of an Audison seventh grader and an Arlington High School freshman. Um, what I'm here about is the, um, the athletic facilities, the track in particular, and the, and the track and field facilities in general. Um, my son is one of about 100 kids in the middle school who signed up for the, um, the middle school running, the middle school mm -hmm. track program. And um, they found, I found out that they're not going to be using the track this week. And then I learned that the track team at the high school is going to have all road meets this year. Um, I went out and checked out the facilities on Tuesday night, and they're looking kind of beat. I don't know what the situation is, if, if this is a school committee thing or a park thing, but it, it's, um, and as a taxpayer, it's kind of concerning to see these nice new, all the work that went in on this, uh, it doesn't appear to be being sufficiently maintained. I guess, going to the previous speaker, we're a little far from world class right now. Great, Aisha, I think um, Ms. Johnson has some information about the track. The, we had hoped that we would have sufficient surplus from when we renovated the field to do the track um, in the spring, but we did not. And so it's in the capital plan subject to appropriation by town meeting this spring with the hopes that the renovation will take place starting July 1. Okay, and that just to, to make sure I understand it then, is. Is anybody going to be using the track then this spring, or is it you know the, this middle school program, or is uh, that point of order? Yeah. Uh, We're yeah, engaging sorry. in conversation yeah, okay, under. Right. Uh, yeah, okay, thanks. <laughs> sorry. <laughs> okay, so maybe just generally, you, I I don't know what that means if it's if it's. I think you can direct your questions to Ms. Johnson in email, and, and she can maybe direct. Perfect. Yeah, mm -hmm. that works. Great. Thank, Thank you, you very much. Thank okay, you. thanks. Mm -hmm. Okay, so um, now we're jumping around a bit. We have um, uh, Dr. Bodie's um, recommendation to the committee, um, and I think we're going to look to take a vote tonight about the educational impact of the option of repurposing the Gibbs versus an Audison edition. And at this point, as I understand it, we're not talking about what we would do with the Gibbs if we were to repurpose it. Okay, That's Dr. Correct. Bodie. Well, I think that the teachers that were here earlier uh, really sort of s summarized my feelings about the recommendation, which is that of the two options of, of uh, repurposing Gibbs for the Arlington Public Schools as a middle school, whether a single grade or a six through eight, or have an addition, my recommendation is that we uh, bring the Gibbs Building back into service for the Allington Public Schools. Uh, I, ha I had completed a chart of all of the various things to take a look at in terms of the decisions as to whether you look at walkability or school culture or programs, <laughs> extracurriculars. There's, there's a complete list of all of the different comparisons. But really, um, it comes down to, <coughs> despite the fact that there, there may seem like one is preferable than the other. We have to look holistically at the decision, and that is which, which environment is going to be the best environment <coughs> of the two for our students. And mm -hmm. having a large middle school of 1,300, 1,400, and that may grow beyond that, is just too large of an environment at this very important time of students' lives. And uh, 
while I, I've done a fair amount of reading on this, and I'm sure you probably have as well, that it's fairly inconclusive as to what the actual size of the building is on student achievement. But what you can find a, quite a bit of in the literature is the relationship of size of the building to how students feel about being in school, anxiety, um, behaviors in the school environment. So, and, and all of that plays an important role on student learning. The other thing that um, is important is we as a district have been looking over the last few years at how to improve school cultures so that we, we um, support our students and their social emotional learning uh, to help our students in, a, in an environment that's going to be very positive. We, we know from many discussions at this table that we're experiencing um, greater anxiety among our students, and that's true at all levels. We've even talked about it at the preschool level. And we're not unique. Arlington's definitely not unique in this, that this is a discussion that's going on in, definitely in this area, and I think that it's a discussion that's much broader than even Massachusetts. So what can we do to uh, provide a more positive culture? Um, we certainly have done a lot of work in this district and we're continuing to do a lot of work, um, beginning even with our kindergarten with the Tools of the Mind program. We have looked at that in terms of how we support students in that, in that area of growth. So when, we, when our students come to the middle school, the best thing I think that we can do for them is to provide environments that is more scaled to their needs and to a culture in which um, they are going to be able to feel more efficacy and uh, support, develop stronger peer relationships with both uh, with teachers as well. And so despite the fact that there's going to be incremental costs and despite the fact that there's other issues that may appear that in addition might make sense because you, you, you're really only growing a school by its um, the, the factor of enrollment growth, I, I have to recommend to you that we, we that, that encourage you to um, choose and recommend uh, that we simply repurpose the Gibbs School. Uh, Mr. Thielman. So I move that we endorse the superintendent's recommendation uh, as a uh, detailed in the April 10th, 2016 memo to the school committee. Second. Second. Okay. And I'll speak to the motion. Mm -hmm. Okay, great. Okay. So just briefly, <laughs> Mr. Thielman I, made you know, a motion, <laughs> sorry, uh, seconded by Mr. Slickman, and now we'll have discussion on the motion, Mr. Thielman. Yeah, so the school enrollment task force asked the uh, school department uh, to uh, make a recommendation on what's best educationally. So this memo addresses what's best educationally, we're still going through a process of evaluating what's best fiscally, mm -hmm. and uh, the two may have to be reconciled. Uh, but for now, I think our motion is very basically is very uh, focused on an educational recommendation. So I think it should be adopted by the school committee. Mark. Yeah, Mr. Hayner. Uh, just a clarification: yeah. Do we need any specific language to state that we're recommending to the town to remove uh, Gibbs? From surplus. No, I, I don't know if we need what any I, legal. I think we're what at this point we're rec so making a recommendation to the task we, force. Somewhere this along. This is a recommendation to the task force. This is a recommendation to the task force. The task force still needs to make their decision, which we've sort of time given for, them. Time yeah. for a second. Somewhere along the line, when Gibbs came offline, it was put into surplus, and that required a vote from the school committee. Yeah. After what happened yesterday, and I'm not at the long range planning. I'm not saying it's going to 100% go forward. But if we have to continually come back for different votes, uh, all I'm saying is that. Yeah, I understand that we will have to make a motion at that point uh, later, but, like but I, I, I think That's what I think. If, what I've if this group is making a decision between Audison and uh, Gibbs, and it doesn't come We're not come making up, a decision. Excuse me. Yes, sir. This is our recommendation, or, or, or we're basically making a decision. We, if, if we go forward to this tonight on this, and the enrollment task force supports it, and everyone else, we're not going to change our mind. I don't see that happening. Mm -hmm. All I'm saying is, if we make a, a, a motion to take it, whatever we have to do legally and do it now, if it doesn't happen, it's, it's a void in, in, in effect. 
Okay, uh, Dr. Alsanfi, did you want to talk to that? Um, I was going to speak to the motion that's on the table. Okay, um, um, what do we have? We want clarification about this issue. I can wait. Okay, or, go ahead, please. Yes, I. I um, I agree with Mr. Thielman that we're taking this motion because it's felt to be the best educationally. Um, I know that I'm thinking of the community at large that may be thinking, well, why can't they just put another addition onto the school? And I think one of the things, um, part of what you need to think about with the Audison is the actual physical building that is already there and the physical location it is on. And I think that both of those go a long way towards pushing us against adding an addition because the building as it's already structured um, takes up most of the lot. Mm -hmm. There are very mm -hmm. few places that an addition could actually physically be put and it fills almost the entire lot. It, um, I think when mm -hmm. people are thinking that you could just pop something in, they're thinking of the ideal school that has lots of open space mm -hmm. all around it and is, is physical, you know, it's on a flat spot. And, thing. and I think there could be a middle school, even that size, that could potentially accept an addition. Mm -hmm. The problem is we don't have that middle school. Mm -hmm. We have the Audison. Mm -hmm. And so um, I just wanted to speak to why we're ruling out the um, addition because of the specifics of what we're dealing with, so. Mr. Slickin? Yeah, I think the, the common space issues at the Audison are a huge issue. The logistics, we looked at the model of, of how they'd have to attach this and put this on pillars out in front of the building. Uh, this is not a viable option. This is not educationally sound. We're not going to be create the kind of educational experience that we want for our kids, and in fact, to take kids from small elementary schools and plop them in a tight, condensed, largest middle school in the state is a tremendous disservice to our kids. It's a tremendous disservice to the people who have to work with them. It is not educationally sound. It's not a viable option. I don't know what the numbers are going to be financially, but educationally, this is not an acceptable proposal. We need to move forward, and we need to move forward with the Gibbs. Mr. Thielen, did you have? Well, I was going to try to answer Mr. Hainer's yeah, question. Yeah, that'd be but great. Dr. Bodie had her. Mm -hmm. I don't want to preempt you. Um, I, I talked with uh, uh, our town council, uh, Mr. Heim, and he said there's no specific language. It's, um, it's essentially that you are going to not agree to have Gibbs surplus right. uh, beyond June 30th. Do you feel this motion would satisfy that? No, I don't. I don't oh, have that sense. No. No, no, no. The, this, this, this motion here. Let, let me put it in context, um, which Mr. Thielman had done. I thought a pretty good job of. We've been asked. The task force has asked us to make a. Re re actually, more specifically, you and you've asked me uh, to make a recommendation to them about your preference from an educational point of view. On, on April 28th the task force is going to hear the study that was done by HMFH looking at the feasibility and costs of the two. And we don't know quite where that's going to fall out yet. We have some idea about that given the, the study that was done last year. So there's that cost. There's also they've asked for incremental costs, which I have provided and, and I'm continually looking to, re, to um, revise, and frankly, every time I come back to it a different way, I'm coming to roughly the same numbers I gave the task force uh, a, a, month or two, a couple months ago. So there is three, three major considerations. Um, there's going to be the cost of the project itself, because this is going to be on town mm -hmm. funds. Mm -hmm. There's going to be what is going to be the effect on operating budgets going forward, which is no small thing either, because as you know from our discussions, this is very tight, and we have a plan going forward which doesn't easily accommodate an increase of six or seven hundred thousand. Mm -hmm. And then there's the educational, and that, and all of these are going to go in a mix. So what they want to know is from you, your what you think is the best educationally. That will go into a mix that they will hear, and they will make a recommendation. Right. Um, 
And so where we go from there is uh, the, there'll be steps after that. Right. Okay, Mr. Hainer. My only concern is that if everything goes in, the, goes in, a, 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 in line and the intent is to go for a debt exclusion at the time that was discussed, there's X amount of days for the selectmen to put that on a ballot. And that's my only concern. Yeah, so. Uh, that, mm -hmm. that I would ask the chair or the superintendent to look at the timeline and if nothing else, put it on the next agenda if, if it's necessary. If it's not necessary, that's fine. But just get clarification so that mm -hmm. we don't lose out on a technicality. That's right. my only concern. Right. Uh, yeah, I mean, I, I, I know a little bit about the timing of it, right? The mm -hmm. superintendent ne needs, I mean, the, superintendent, the um, Board of Selectmen need to put this um, suggested to be put on the ballot 35 days before so, June 11th. So if that, if that is the so recommendation. So if, if, if I may. Yeah. If we're looking at the beginning of May to, to take a vote. Right. It's very tight. That is extremely tight. It is. I, I, mm -hmm. uh, I mean, <laughs> it's very tight. We're going to talk a little I, bit about our schedule soon. I, I'm on record with the town right now. Yep. Okay. It's tight. I don't want to lose on a technicality. That's my concern. Mm -hmm. Mr. Thielman. So the Long Range Planning Committee discussion uh, yesterday morning, what the group decided was that the appropriate time to take the vote to repurpose Gibbs was after the debt exclusion vote, which we recommended right. for June 11th. Yep. So following that vote, the school committee would convene and take a vote on the Gibbs. So potentially on the 23rd of so June. So removing it from surplus. Right. Yeah. So yeah. if yeah. that yeah. works, that's, 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 that's potentially. That's fine. That's Thank you. Yeah. And I apologize for taking the that's time of the, the committee. Ms. Alessandri. I was just going to say I, I agree with what Mr. Thelman yeah. said, that, that that's what mm -hmm. we had talked about. Right. And the advantage of that is that we're not trying, we're not saying Surplus, no, not surplus, surplus, no, right. going right. back and forth. Yeah. And, and just to clarify, one other point it's important to make is that this conversation started in July. So mm -hmm. we've been working with the tenants. We've been, in, uh, th they've been well aware of this issue. Mm -hmm. uh, they've been looking for other space. Mm -hmm. We've been working with some of the tenants to find other space. Mm -hmm. So this is, it's not news. Mm -hmm. Yep. Yep, but, and yes, yeah, so we've been talking about this for a long time, but we do have a couple of months that are very tight. Um, but I, I think everyone's aware of the deadlines. Um, okay, so call I'm only a few minutes late. <laughs> call the vote. Uh, yeah. Oh, we. Sh I'm sorry. We yes, vote. we got to vote on this. Okay. Um, all those in favor of the motion, as articulated by Mr. Thielman. Could we hear it again? Uh, sure, Mr. Th so, Karen, what did I say? I said I said <laughs> I said move that the school committee um, endorse the superintendent's recommendation as articulated in the memo. Uh, dated April 10th, 2016. Okay. Mm -hmm. uh, all those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those opposed, or it's an unanimous vote. Oh, aye. I should say aye. Yes, you should. I should. Yeah, I'm yeah. sorry. <laughs> <laughs> I am new to this. Okay. Okay. You're doing great. <laughs> okay. Um, Could I, may I ask a question? Yes, Mr. So, Hainer. So, would it be appropriate to ask the superintendent, and I'm asking the group as a whole uh, through the chair, uh, to bring forward uh, a recommendation at the next school committee meeting for the co potential configuration? Uh, I'd ask that yeah, yeah. to so the chair of the superintendent if, if, if we should have that up front. Well, we, our next meeting is a half an hour meeting. So we have to oh. actually, <laughs> we're actually going to be talking about that a little bit later, about um, what our future meetings are going to look like. Because this is a conversation we have to have as a committee. Um, another conversation we have to have as a committee I'd like to have is, um, the district goal strategy, uh, district goals. Uh, we talked a little bit about this a couple months ago, and um, I just wanted to bring it up again because this is the time. So the question is how we as a committee want to handle this. So in the past, we've often received a semi-complete document from the superintendent that we've worked to revise in a special um, retreat. Right. Oh, oops. Mm -hmm. A potential, we, we do have another a retreat coming up that is on a different matter already. We have a lot to do. Uh, there's other potential ways of handling it. We could get involved earlier before that document is created. We could take that document to a subcommittee. Um, there's just other potential, just want to hear people's ideas about what, what you'd like to see done with the district goals to session. Mr. Hainer. Whatever way we go, I'd like an opportunity for the community to be involved in that aspect of it 
on the district goals. Uh, we have timelines that, that affect the, the building goals and then the teachers' goals and things of that nature. So from my perspective, I'd like to be up front so that we're not jamming this in to meet those other deadlines. That's so all. So up front meaning? As meaning? soon as possible. OK. So we, I, a subcommittee may be the way to go. Mr. Thielen. Well, um, so I always think that the purpose of a goal statement for the year is to define what's going to be different and better about an institution mm -hmm. a year from now, mm -hmm. whether it's, you know, you're running a hospital, university, a school district, a school, whatever it is. So I, I, my own personal preference for this process is that it comes from the district to us for review because I think it's, I mean, I think we say we want to know what's going to be different about the school district right. and what's going to be better about it as a, to frame it and then the superintendent and her staff go out and think about what's going to be different and better and then we get a document back and then we, we critique it. Mm -hmm. um, so that, I've always liked that process myself. I don't really, my own personal opinion, I don't like a committee, a school committee or a board committee mm -hmm. going off and creating something yep. without knowing what the people who run the district every day think and believe can be changed. And then I think we have to give them, you know, feedback yeah. in this process mm -hmm. and say, you know, I don't think that's strong enough or I don't think you're being realistic or you forgot about this goal or that goal. Right. So that's how I like a check and balance in that way. That's my, that's my comfort zone. Mr. Slickman, you were making, no, you didn't, okay. <laughs> uh, Ms. Allison Ampe. Mm -hmm. um, oh, Dr. Sorry. I'm, I'm not sure I'm understanding what you're proposing. Right now, my understanding is the district goals are formulated by the superintendent with working with her cabinet mm -hmm. of yeah. um, administrators mm -hmm. and then they bring it to us to look at when you talk about having other people participate are you saying that we formulate kind of a different thing and then we're like intercalate it or are you i i i, I just want to open up no it wasn't i wasn't thinking that way i just wanted to open up well, it it feels to me i mean i've only been on for a couple of years but that we often feel like rushed at the end about these district goals and so that I just wanted to open up the conversation earlier about what we want to see happen with it and actually it might be appropriate for Dr. Bowie to talk about the process that's changed this year with her administrative team. All right, can I do a little bit of context yes, too? Can, um, yes, it does great. feel a little rushed and, and part of that was because of the way the educator evaluation system uh, has evolved and I think that that's something we, we all have to sort of, you, you live with this for a while and you have to think about it because teachers um, have to determine their goals by October 1st. And their goals are related to their school improvement goals, which are related to the district goals. So we have an agreement that we've worked out and through negotiations and just good common sense among us all is how we, how we need to move this forward. Now, we've now moved district goals into the May, June, where we, we all approve it. Now, one of the disadvantages of this timeline, quite frankly, is that we've, with administrators, we have a chance to sort of, uh, in the summer, mm -hmm. do a reevaluation, see where we are, and then before we used to come to the, in the fall and have something for you in the fall. But, and that's something we might want to look at together again, and certainly with, with, the, with the teachers as well. So where we are right now is that if we're looking at the four overarching goals, which pretty much talks about the vision of the Arlington Public Schools in terms of what we're looking at for achievement for our students, the professional development for our teachers, and, uh, and certainly all of the infrastructure, um, things that need to happen to create the right environments and the level of communication. So those are all things that we want to see happen, but every year we find new strategies. And we next, well, one of the things we've been looking at with student achievement the last few years, and this is part of the dialogue between all of us, is that looking at MCAS scores mm -hmm. and PBI scores and uh, SG, is student growth scores. But, but this year, because we're moving into the park, we're, we're suggesting taking that off the table for the year. Mm -hmm. And now thinking about well, what's another way that we can really look at student achievement and how would we want to define um, what we think uh, are good measures of student achievement. And so we began that discussion 
last week through more of a collaborative process, which we're hoping that the teachers will also engage in over the next couple of weeks to the extent that's possible in our timeline. Um, and we looked at area, what, what the whole area of social emotional growth. What are we doing well? What, what, what would be good indicators that we've made improvements and next year's better? And what are the obstacles to that? And so we, we've begun that already uh, with the administrative team. And um, I, I, can't, I can't tell you right now we have some goals. We've had some good discussions. And uh, so maybe having some of that in, in, commit in, in a, a subcommittee would be good in the next few weeks to see where, where we are in that process. Yeah, so actually mm -hmm. one question, that, one suggestion that was brought up earlier mm -hmm. is to maybe send this to a subcommittee, which I think we haven't done, at least it seems like a couple of years I've been on, um, to have we'll some of the discussion go on there. Um, Mr. Hainer. I would agree with Mr. Thielman. I, th I think it is a good idea to have him come, come back to us. One of my concerns is uh, an issue on the uh, superintendent's diversity task force is come up periodically and there's a hope, and my hope as well, cultural proficiency. We've talked about it, but I'd like to see that as a, an integral part of our overarching goals uh, embedded in it. We have, we've had issues this year dealing with uh, different ethnic ash issues. Um, I think it has, uh, when it's done well, the research that I've seen, it has an effect on student achievement mm -hmm. across the board. Uh, so I, I would ask that that be a priority consideration, uh, cultural proficiency. Mm -hmm. So, yeah. It came up repeatedly in our discussion, so we're all on the same wavelength there. Thank you. So let's, I, I maybe sort of throw out some timing and see if this seems right to everyone. Um, so on the meeting on the 12th, we could see the beginning draft that could then be sent mm -hmm. to subcommittee, or is that too late? Oh, that's fine. That sounds good. Talking this May, is, May this is May. <coughs> yeah. Mm -hmm. so, so, so May 12th, we'll see the beginning, but it'll be sent to subcommittee. Um, is there a desire to have another retreat around goals, or? So, so do this on subcommittee. Mr. Slickman. Yeah, I, I mean, the thing is, is we've got a set of overarching goals which right. drive our district goals. We've also got a set of goals for which we're evaluating the superintendent. Mm -hmm. So now we're really dealing with the overarching goals, the district goals, and the superintendent's goals. Mm -hmm. uh, we can goal ourselves out, uh, you know, and, and I think that at this point, to work within the context of all the existing uh, structure of goals that we have this is going to be a tweaking process that we get into a little conversation in subcommittee and okay. and get a sense of where everybody's at and then we could be able to bring it back. This shouldn't be a difficult process. Okay, so it sounds like, so potentially we will be seeing this on the 12th of May, it'll be sent to subcommittee and then it'll come back to the committee. Is that, that's, Mr. Thielen. Yeah, so one, one point I wanna make, you know, we got into this, this whole thing about the goals have to be done by June because of the state law, right? Is that what the whole, is that what caused them? No. no. Oh, that's the superintendent's no, goals a, on the evaluation. Yeah. Okay. Which we, well, we, do we have a policy later. that we're not following, actually. It's a little bit uh, earlier. <coughs> so anyway, um, it would be, uh, one thing I, would, I do think it would be good to reevaluate the timeline for that policy because yeah. the, you, you really, when you, right. you know, you can talk about the goals all you want in May and June and then when you, get to the summer, you can think a little bit more as a leadership team about where you're really gonna go as a district for the year. Mm -hmm. And the other thing is, you know, we still have to finish the goals for FY16, and one of those goals for FY16 is space issues, yes. and we mm -hmm. might have a vote on June 11th that's mm -hmm. gonna take up some time with people involved mm -hmm. on the committee. Yes, uh, I just Dr. wanna Allison. point out the reason it was backed up was at the administration's request because the teachers needed to yes. know earlier mm -hmm. so that they yeah. could set their things, so it. Well, that's how that happened. Mm -hmm. Yeah, it, it wasn't so, us. So it sounds like actually, if we send this, when we send this to the subcommittee, um, a conversation about timing could actually be part yeah, of that, I think that's that a good discussion. Thing. Well, it was uh, something sorry. that was negotiated with the union. So this is. Oh, is that minus? Yeah, yeah. So there's, that we have to bring everybody together. Well, I would just uh, say one thing to look at. about in, this in down the, the road. We, the Mr. Hainer. Yeah. Excuse me. Yeah. We can do it earlier as long as we don't ask them to squish theirs. Mm -hmm. we, we can arbitrarily put, uh, set the goals earlier, is mm -hmm. what I'm saying. Am I wrong in that? Well, that's what we're doing now. We're yeah, working to do I'm, that. Yeah, but all I'm saying is with regard to the union is, is that we negotiated to give them X amount of time for, so that the, they wouldn't be crunched. Am I correct? 
If some people wanted to know the direction that we're going as a district in terms of emphasis so that in the summer, if there was work they wanted to do or they wanted to participate in right. professional development in the summer, they uh, are right. doing that. Rather than hearing about it in September, exactly. it's just too late. So if we decided to do it in February, we could do it on our own. We wouldn't have to involve them on that. I'm, not th I'm using that as a, <laughs> yeah. as a broad example, that's all. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Okay, uh, so I don't think we need a vote, just wanted to get a sense of the committee. Um, so m we are now no longer behind schedule, which is great. Um, monthly financial reports, Ms. Johnson. Well, I will do my best to keep us moving in that direction. Um, there really isn't much to report from prior months because uh, the last of the purchase order submissions are happening as of tomorrow. Mm -hmm. So by the May reports, we'll be doing two things. We will have hopefully booked all of the planned expenditures through the end of the year, and we will start reducing um, blanket purchase orders that are put up at the beginning of the year. This is the time of the year when we go, particularly in facilities, but also in energy and other things, we start tailing back purchase orders if we feel there's surplus funds in them, and that allows us to zero in on a closer picture. Mm -hmm. uh, questions, Mr. Hainer. Uh, on the tracking report, line 82103. Okay, hold on, let me get there. I'm sorry. Eight two one zero three. You said yes. Our electricity. Uh huh. Uh, this no. only shows the general fund. It doesn't show the revolving accounts from which much I, of this is paid. I'm not looking at the money right now. I'm just the, the last statement says expense will be moved mm. to the revolving account. Got it. Yeah, okay. And my other question is uh, on the grants. Mm -hmm. Pete, there were. Uh, it's a general question. Several items, uh, pensions and MTRB. They were budgeted, and you're listing at no expense. That's right. We do that by journal entry at the end of the year. MTRB is being. So, you, so we're not, but it says estimate to completion. Right. It implies that it's going to be a surplus. It, it isn't. Okay. So I guess if I saw it listed and uh, you've encumbered it, then We've I would. We've not encumbered it yet. Okay, the way it looks right now, it looks like- Can you like give a, me a specific grant that you're looking at? Uh, the METCO one. Okay. Uh, 81730, pensions, and then 31 would be MTRB pensions. And there are several others similar. And I don't see an 81730 in METCO. I'm a title yeah, one, I apologize. I, I looked at the- Oh, yeah. Yes, because we have both teachers and non-teachers that are being paid out of the- Right, all I'm saying is the way I'm reading it. I'm not questioning what you're doing. Mm -hmm. The way I'm reading it, it says the budget amount and the estimate to completion is the exact same amount. It, it, it looks to me like we're not going to spend it. Oh, yeah. I can that, see why it would. Right. Right. I think I need to change the verbiage. Thank you. It, it goes through a I whole. what you're saying. It, it looked like we, had a, we weren't going to give, we weren't putting $136,000 worth of pensions that goes through the whole grant thing. We were just, we're going to keep the money. And I no, know I mean, I, you know, I, I will work on the phrasing of that, but the presumption is that all grants are expended fully. Thank you. Uh, Dr. Allison Abbey. Um, I understand that the budget tracking report doesn't have other monies. How, given that, how much are we running behind at this point? If you look at the budget summary, the top sheet, um, 349, 859. Um, Minor in different order, I'm going to have to Right after my memo, summer. there's a very small box of a sheet that consolidates revolving oh, grants. Yeah, okay. okay, I found it. I, I download them onto mm -hmm. my computer because I look at things at times when I'm not online. So Okay. That, okay, got it. Okay, so that one has, has all of... So this is no different than the um, budget tracking one, which you just said, for Correct. example, that the... Uh, electricity would be pulled from another account so because it's we're showing that the that the revolving account re, the revolving account will be fully expended mm -hmm. but if you look at the revolving account it doesn't show a lot of expenses in there yet because we haven't moved the expenses um, I'm still confused okay um, when you look at this top sheet it presumes two things all revolving accounts will be fully expended as budgeted all grants will be fully expended as budgeted We've budgeted electricity in both the general fund and in the revolving account. 
at this point, the expenses for electricity are only residing in the general fund. When we make that, when we move those expenses, as it says in the general fund, it will help to meet that presumption that the revolving will be fully expended. Okay, but I still don't see why the, as it's presented now, it seems like it shouldn't, the, the end number shouldn't be as negative as it is because the electricity in the other one is still in the revolving account. But there are other things running in negative. It's not just electricity at this I point. I understand, but it's $100,000, so I should be able to see it on this, this level. Um, and I'm not, what you're saying is that everything in revolving is going to be spent as it's expected, but the, the numbers aren't matching up. I mean, can, can, can we sit down and talk about this offline? Yeah, but I, because I'm not really sure what you're driving at. <coughs> yeah, we'll talk about it another time, but it, it's, I think it's, confusing how it's presented. It is confusing. The fact that you're expensing things out of various places is really hard and, and I am deliberately making a choice to show the variance only in one place rather than multiple places <coughs> because I think this is the least confusing way to do it. Is it 100 percent right on what's going to end up happening? No, but I think it's, it's more of a model of how to show how over under we are in total rather than specifically. Yeah, I, I think the, the confusion is you can't have a variance from budget at, at nothing for revolving and expect to throw 100 into something, into, you're not understanding. Okay, I'm not, I'm sorry. Probably makes sense for a longer discussion, I think. Um, um, yes, is it just right? a, I, I think the thing that most people are really interested in is how do we look in terms of where we're going to be at the end of this year? Right, and the way we look right now is the 349, but I think that may come down based on how the final expenditures go and how much we can liquidate from already encumbered activities. Mm -hmm. Did you want okay, great, thanks. <coughs> um, okay, so superintendent's report, as I understand, we have some motions in here as well, right? We do. Actually, okay. I have a fairly long report. We have a very long report, but there's a lot, a lot going on. There is. Yeah. And unfortunately, one of the first things I need to talk about is how the day started today. Mm -hmm. and that was that we had uh, yet again another bomb threat at the high school. This time it started, the, the call came in before school started. Uh, in fact, it came in, I think, 730, which is actually a little bit um, different than maybe it was put out there. But the fact is that it was before school. so students and faculty that were in the school were asked to just leave while we could do uh, the, a search of the building. The police came, the fire, in fact, the fire department came today. What we found out then, and also I found out later at a meeting, um, that there were a number of calls today, again, in, in the state. And there were many on Monday, and in fact, one school district next to us um, got one on Monday and they got one on um, today. What is a little concerning is a pattern that is changing though and that is it's been middle school and high schools but there's recently been some elementary and um, that's you know that's it's, it's more difficult I think for young children to really understand uh, this process. So we have uh, certainly protocols in place uh, the high school gets better at these protocols, uh, uh, but each situation has been a little different in terms of the time of day, which also affects it as well. So we're, we're hoping that, that the FBI, frankly, can make some progress in having this, these activities. It's just disruptive, mm -hmm. and, um, um, and, and, it's, and it's happening here in this state, in this area, and it's certainly happening all around the country, in fact. So. Um, but I will say one thing that I, I really want to again thank the police department because and the fire department today but we we work very closely in these situations and um, 
the first person that we call is the police department or, for, or, or the department. All right, so at any rate, hopefully this is our last one as we go forward in this year. So no, a number of things, I'm not, in fact, there's so many things. Uh, let's start with, um, we had some actually good news. Mm -hmm. Yesterday, um, I got a call from our representative Garbley and also from town manager saying that the house budget had come in higher than the governor's budget for chapter 78. And that is great news for us, assuming that in the process, the Senate also maintains the House numbers, which would mean that um, above that 126,000, which was the governor's number, we might have an additional anywhere from 177 to 187. That would be an addition to our, to our budget. And so we may be having some discu discussions in June. Good discussions. Good discussions about, <laughs> and as I was saying to our town manager, we had just finished some, a meeting in which we were talking about, well, we need another point two here, another point two there. It's going to be hard to schedule. We, and yet, of course, none of those point twos are currently in our budget mm -hmm. request. And that always is what happens when you get into scheduling. Mm -hmm. So that's good. Um, but we may not know for a while. Another very positive um, is that I have to, uh, congratulate the high school for an, a truly outstanding performance of Hello Dolly. Oh, yeah. Amazing. That's That's great. Just superb. Yeah. And I heard many people as I was walking out talking that, you know, that this could be on stage and professional, that it's that good. So congratulations to all of them. Um, they did a terrific job. Um, you've already heard that we went to Needham this week and we'll have more discussion about that but I think that overall that was a, it was a good decision to go and I want to thank again publicly um, uh, the staff the principal of, of High Rock and the superintendent who also came and met with us mm -hmm. to give us um, information and are both open to more questions and I'm sure as we go through this process if there's questions that you might have uh, I can certainly relay them to the principal and also the superintendent. And one of the questions I had had for him was incremental costs, which he'll give me more information about. Um, another thing that you should be aware of is last night at Finance Committee, um, there we, we found out the, the right process. If you recall last year, we had $200,000 that we were um, going to put in that had been savings in special education that were going to go into the stabilization account. But because of a technicality, that money has just sort of stayed right now in the reserve account of the Finance Committee. So a mo they last night approved the, pro the process, and the process actually that it has to be voted into the school department operating budget. Mm -hmm. And then, then, then there's a second motion after that to go into the stabilization. It can't mm -hmm. come directly from the, where it's been sitting this last year. So we're all set. I think they've got all the motions in place uh, for town meeting. And, and Diane, you would have, we're all set on that. I hope so. <laughs> There's a lot of discussion about how, that, how to make that work. Um, I also want to um, encourage you, I know that Mr. Schlickman was there last night with, with me at the art exhibit at the high school, which is terrific. Wonderful. wonderful. It's just a wonderful exhibit. And if you have a chance to stop by, there will be another art exhibit, which is more of a K-12 exhibit um, at town in May at Town Hall. So uh, if you miss this, there'll be another opportunity coming up. And I'll, I'll send you an email on the, the time of that reception as well. Um, uh, we had a, an actual a, a great event this week, which we had more applicants. And, and maybe you want to talk a little bit about that, um, Mr. Siegel. Because he worked with our, well, we all work together, but we have the diversity, we have a, I have a committee, uh, as an advisory committee on diversity that we meet with regularly, and they were a great help with this. But I'll let you talk about it. So as we have for the past few years, we've host, we hosted a coffee social for potential applicants to the district um, um, seeking um, applicants um, from diverse backgrounds uh, for positions in the district and we had 13 candidates um, come to the social plus um, members of the advisory committee. Ms. Starks came as a representative of the school committee. 
the superintendent, the assistant superintendent, um, some a principal, a couple of principals, and and curriculum leaders, and um, Ms. Elmer. So we had a staff from our administrative team represented as well to talk to the candidates about potential openings if they fit in their area um, of uh, their certification area. So. Um, it's a good way to make contacts um, with people for them to um, get their name in front of and a face in front of our, um, our administrators um, in a more informal setting uh, than an interview. Um, and potentially some of them could come in for interviews for positions that we have open um, down the road, we, um, or soon. So it's, it's a good event. The, advisory committee um, was instrumental in calling some of the candidates. The candidates were generated from job fairs that I attended. Um, the MPDE, the Mass Partnership for Diversity, Diversity in Education, hosted a job fair in March. Several of the candidates who we met at that job fair came to the social. I also attended job fairs at Boston College and Lesley University. And um, there may have been some other outreach that people made, but the members of the advisory committee did actually make calls to candidates who I had met, and I had given them a spreadsheet of um, phone numbers and email addresses. And they, some of the candidates commented that they were impressed that they got the personal phone calls from the advisory committee. Um, so we, uh, I think it was successful. We'll see how it result, what the result is mm -hmm. from the. Uh, you know, from the coffee in, in terms of our hiring. I will comment that, um, you know, maybe I need to expand my job fair <laughs> attendance, and some of it is scheduling, and hard. it's hard to get to them all. Some of the job fairs that w we have attended, um, aside from the MPDE job fair, do not have a large number of diverse candidates. So that is one issue that the schools of education are dealing with. Um, and I've talked about that before, some of the, the pool problems that um, we have in Massachusetts and in other parts of the country. Um, but it's a, it, you know, it's an ongoing thing that we're working on. Did you want me to comment on the other, the hiring, or no, is that something you wanted to save? For um, that was in the, yeah, well, I put, the I put, it's in the, it's in the report. Um, yeah. That they can have, uh, well, let me just, unless they have any questions for you. I, I'm sorry you're getting it. I wasn't planning to talk to the progress report because I did talk about it in March 31st, but everybody wanted to have the written part. And of course, when I start getting into the written part, I always add more and more detail. And um, so we had people that helped with the different parts of it. And it's, it's there in your packet. Uh, I think the issue relative to this particular um, issue is that we've seen some progress this year, but you could talk a little bit about it because it does relate to the, the efforts we're trying to do in order to increase our um, our, can, our 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 staff of, um, so that they're more diverse <coughs> and more reflective of the students we have. Right, we have seen some progress, and the report does list. Um, some of the positions that we filled since October 1st, since we've, um, since I gave you the, the last um, hiring report in the fall, um, and some of the things that we're doing um, to, <coughs> you know, some of the, the things that we continue to do to um, increase diversity. One of the best ways I think that we hire teachers, classroom teachers in this district is through our student teachers that we get in the district and our teaching assistants. Um, so that is an area that we are, we are continually look to, f to focus on to increase the diversity of our student teachers in the district and our teaching assistants because who are working towards um, educator licensure. So that people on those paths, once they get into a building, they know um, the teachers and the principal and the students. Um, are more, they're more successful, I think, starting out. They're not brand new to the building, and they get to know people, and it's sort of a, a way to, uh, to learn about someone before you make a decision to hire them into mm -hmm. um, a teaching position. Yeah. All right, if there's no question, let me just move on, because we actually have a lot. So actually bulleted here 
um, just make a comment again, is that the superintendent's mid-year evaluation report is just bulleted so that, um, to highlight that it's there. Um, and if there's more that we wanna talk about it, maybe we can do that at the next meeting. Because I'm sure that there'll be more that we'll add to it at the end of the year in, in yeah, terms of our work. Year. Yeah. But I, I'm sure one of the things you're very interested in is the update on kindergarten enrollment. Mm -hmm. Yep. yep. <laughs> um, we have right now registered 425 25 students. And what we're seeing already, in fact, we, uh, Karen Tassoni and I work together and looking at buffer zones, that already Thompson and Hardy are definitely approaching the numbers that, that the McKibben report in December said they would be approaching. Thompson <laughs> faster yeah. than even Hardy. Right now, um, Thompson is well on its way. In fact, it's almost right there, and this is Hardy's getting, is moving up there very close as well. Um, Dr. McKibben's report had predicted 81 students at Thompson and that being fairly steady for the next few years. And I think that's definitely what we're gonna see if not more uh, as we go along. So where does the 425 compare to where we were this time last year? And we're pretty much on target as to where in fact maybe a little, right so close to where we were last year. And our final numbers were in the high 400s when we finally got to September. So I expect that's the case. We're getting more registrations all the time. And actually one of the things that one of our building secretaries discovered, so I'm gonna put a little plug in here tonight. If you are already an Arlington public school parent and you have siblings, children in the school, but you have a kindergartner coming up please register that child. We discovered at one school, a school unnamed, uh, had six families that we knew there was a kindergarten student coming up and had not registered yet. We haven't done that uh, complete analysis at other schools. Uh, third kid, you kind of. Uh, <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. So, highly encourage that. Um, we're we're going to do a deeper analysis and start calling people that may have that third or fourth kid that's, that's yeah, not in there. Year, <laughs> did you get a call last year, Mr. Like Thielman? Yeah, we did. I thought, I was like, yeah, I thought you were registering. I thought I was ready. It was like one of those conversations at home. Yeah, yeah. So, so we're, we're going to, um, uh, we're going to be getting, finishing the, the buffer zone assignments by next week, uh, get letters out. The first meeting at schools this year is gonna be May 10th, and principals are sending that, that notice out. We're also going to be doing um, a change, as you know, in the, during the screenings this June, and parents will get a, a notification about that, and know more about it even on May 10th. But um, the start of school, and, I, and I don't, that will go out again in the letters in terms of Do you want making them. Tell us again. One more time. Yeah, yeah, that'd be great. That Tuesday, right after Labor Day, will be just a quick visit, an hour. It's um, just so they can come in, see the classroom, mm -hmm. um, see, uh, meet their teacher, because they won't really meet their teacher in June. Mm -hmm. Now, that gives our kindergarten teachers the rest of the day to, to do screenings of students that did not participate in the June screenings. Then the next day, Half the class will come in from, for the whole day so that they go through all the routines in a smaller group. And then the other half will do that on Thursday and then the entire class will come together on Friday for the last day of the week. And they'll go home exhausted to their parents on Friday afternoon. And do we need a vote tonight on the new calendar change? Um, you already voted it. We voted this, okay. You voted it, right. and, but you'll have another calendar later in May when we get the- we have, you're right. Look at the calendar that I got in my package. It has uh, November 23rd, and if I'm reading it correctly with the key, it says kindergarten students to start Tuesday, September 2nd. I think it's a, our all, all school early release. It's just the key, November 23rd. Uh, it, says Thanksgiving you have a break. It's a double the Thanksgiving break, and you have it, two asterisks on it. When I look down at the key, the key. Oh, there's, <laughs> the asterisks are wrong. Okay, yeah. So okay. Right, well, we'll, we'll, we'll 
Got that fixed. Gone. Yeah. Right. Thanksgiving break. Right. But, but again, it is. Oh, because that was just the first it's, it's read. And so this, yeah, this is you. document for approval. No, you're right. Okay, okay. you're I, right. Yeah, I thought we had to still vote. Okay. Just a fix okay, on so the Okay, so clarification, we do have to vote for, on this. Mr. Slickman, you have a. Yeah, we do also need to vote to add our meeting dates. We haven't established a oh. meeting calendar for us for 16, 17. But that's in here now. That's in here now. Right. Oh. Just put in the second and third. We just, and so it's automatic. So we, um, as of now, do you know if there's an issue? Should we Our wait? Our policy is that we vote dates right. rather than it's automatically second and fourth. Right. So <clears throat> I haven't gone through it. I haven't gone through it. But either. we have to look for MASC conference right. and a yeah, couple of other yep. things that we end up running against. Yep. Um, so if we vote this in, we can still revise it, or should we not? Oh, vote you're going to have it? another vote in yeah. in uh, <coughs> May with uh, all the other pieces of it. Mm -hmm. The reason we wanted you to vote on this now is that we we, we don't want to say, well, this is tentative to kindergarten parents. We want right. to say this right. is the, the this is what's happening. Right. So, so the I move done? I move that we uh, adopt the uh, kindergarten start date as Dr. Bodie mm -hmm. articulated. Fine. Okay. okay. So, so uh, uh, clarification, are we adopt m having a motion only on the kindergarten start date? Yes. Or on yes, the calendar? Yes, just the calendar. Just, just the kindergarten just start. That sounds great. Dr. Allison Abbey. I'm sorry. I didn't, mm. I don't understand what the kindergarten start date is. And I'm also looking at the calendar and it's not written on the calendar. So I think we want to make mm -hmm. it more clear or, or the, something. The double no. asterisks up at the top. So if you look down below, it says kindergarten students just start Tuesday, September 2nd, 6th. 6th, right. That's what we're going It doesn't spell out the details of what that means. But yeah, so it didn't. I was hearing day, different They things. go half on mm -hmm. Wednesday, half on Thursday, all on Friday. Mm -hmm. But yes, yeah. it's all explained in the letter. But the start so date, if you look at the top of the calendar. Yeah, no, I, I see. I, I personally find what's written there to be, I mean, I can't tell it says s equals grades and then there's asterisk asterisk k dash 12 first day but if you go all the way to the bottom all the way to the bottom of that so that double asterisk we, it says kindergarten start date all the way to the bottom so we the are not voting oh, then on this calendar okay. yeah but yeah okay Just so the we're, start yeah. Date. we're yeah. voting yeah. on the um proposal by dr bode to change the kindergarten start date on the new calendar as are you know spelled out in your yes. recommendation i think is right. what we're voting on now that's all you're voting on okay so we can so any more discussion on that motion okay so all those in favor to say aye. Aye. aye and the chair votes in the affirmative which i haven't been doing um and that's a um universal but, oh i'm sorry we didn't second it does anyone want to second it Excellent. <laughs> second by Mr. Yes. parliamentary a second is not required if we discuss it Really? Yeah. yeah. Oh. Once it's discussed, it's, it's deemed it's seconded. It's oh, interesting. Oh, okay. Mm -hmm. Interesting. Hmm. All right. Okay. okay. All right. Grab his rules. Okay. Um, a couple more things, but one of them I know you want to have some update on that Dr. Chesson is going to give you as where we are on park. Yes. Um, that's we're not, we're going to get that now. Yeah. Just a great. quick, just a Absolutely. quick, great. because it's starting right after vacation. Yep. Yep. And, and you received in correspondence a copy yes. of this, just so you are aware. Um, so in correspondence, we discussed, um, we listed the parent meetings that we've had at the mm -hmm. elementary level and at the middle school level, the teacher trainings that we've had at the elementary and secondary level, um, student trainings that were held at the computer-based testing sites of Audison and Bishop, mm -hmm. um, the paper-based testing training for students, um, we ran a infrastructure test um, for technology infrastructure already at um, Bishop and, and Audison, um, and they went pretty smoothly, just a couple of minor things. It had nothing actually to do with technology, but the users of the technology. Um, and we have um, put up our presentations on, uh, from the parent meeting on the district website as well as the OPEC website. Um, teachers have had an, in their trainings have raised a number of FEQs and the answers to those have been paced, placed on the teaching and learning website. Um, the testing schedule has been distributed to all stakeholders, uh, the teachers, the, uh, the parents, um, and a detailed testing schedule um, will be sent home to parents. And um, 
uh, a reminder by the, will be sent home by the individual pr um, principals just prior to the testing. Elementary begins on Monday for the most part, the Monday after vacation, um, and uh, the Audison begins on Tuesday uh, after vacation. Um, it is a long testing window. It goes from April 25th to May 26th. So when do the notices go out to parents? So the, the, the parent, the, the, it will be go home through email. It won't be a oh, right. I mean, right. I mean, it, yeah, my so understanding is that the principals each were sending them home at different times, but oh, okay. they would be sent but home. But this week, week, yes. Hopefully, oh, by the end. Okay. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, uh, Dr. Austin, have you? Um, I see that it's listed on correspondence received, but we didn't actually get it in our... Yeah, no, yeah, that, that's, yeah. I'm just, can we either get it in Novus or can you email it to us or something? Yeah. That's all. Thank you. Yeah, Thank you. I thought you were talking about prior correspondence, yeah. Okay, a um, couple more things. Um, I'll be, be, be finished. One of the things I wanted to ask um, this evening is if you would approve a motion to uh, um, give me the, uh, the authority, the discretion to... Um, exercise this, well, I should say, to exercise the same discretion with respect to principles as we currently have with AEA and, and AAA with regard to uh, children attending the Arlington Public Schools. We discussed this in the policy subcommittee, and, um, and I just would, would like to have a, a, a motion. I prepared a motion and just asked if uh, the committee would approve it. Mr. Rainer. Just, I would ask you, uh, I have no problem voting on this now, but before even implementing it, to just check with council to see if this would be, it's necessary to, to put an optional, keep, maintain the option, but put language in their individual contracts, because this may be deemed like a second agreement with them. And remember the issue that oh. we had? That, the, the, all of it. Yeah, no, that's a good suggestion. I, I'll, I'll, I'll I, have no, I have no problem giving you that authorization, but I, just for our, your sake and our sake, just to, Thank you. Yep. Mr. Dillon, do you make a motion? The school committee moves that the superintendent may exercise the same discretion regarding the children of principals attending Arlington Public Schools as allowed under both the AEA and AAA contracts. Second. Okay. Second, Mr. Schiffman. Discussion on the motion? Just, I uh, just have one more. Yep, Mr. Uh, Dr. Bodie, so we don't have to come back again, possibly in the future. We might have other administrators that aren't covered under what you just said. We have, well, all the administrators would be under AAA. Now there'd be, no, <laughs> we don't have. I was gonna say the central <laughs> office people are not. That's, I guess what, what I'm saying is, do we, do we want to broaden it or do we want to wait for you to bring another one back? Um, Sorry that's to put up you to, in that spot. I, I can, you can wait till I bring another one back or you can amend the motion to, to, to all administrators in the district, if you want. Uh, Not covered by AAA. So I think discussion on this motion and Dr. Asanbe. I'd, I'd prefer that we just leave it at principals right now because yeah. we're still really counting heads. I think it's fair to broaden it to them because we're doing it for the teachers and the, and the other administrators, but I just want to keep an eye on yeah. how much we're actually. We doing. have only I three or four, t I think that's it. So, it's right, not, so the, the broadening very, would affect only a few people. Is and, that it's, right? and it's all based on a, a formula that I have right. for availability. It's, yeah. And, yeah. That, mm -hmm. and we look at that very closely. Um, so it's strictly availability. Yep. Samson, did you want to speak to this? I just have one really just, I guess, comment, not for discussion, but just in terms of if there would be multiple um, applicants for a, the a same grade. I haven't really thought about this before, but criteria for, you know, mm. which of the different units would get the spot. By seniority or by something else. Right. And we don't really have anything bridging all three of those groups. Mm -hmm. So just something for thought. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it might suggest a policy change. Mr. Hainer. If I'm not wrong, I thought there would, it may have happened in AAA back when I was involved, but the discussion was that we felt that decision would be left to the superintendent if it got to that. It may not have happened in AEA. That's, it, it didn't because okay. we were yeah. first. But, so then but, things right. happened. So I mean, I, I mean, a question. I, did, I know I remember hearing the question, and it was. I thought the end result was the superintendent would make that decision. I don't know. That may be something for later negotiations. 
Okay, so what, which motion is on the table? Do we principal. want to amend it or do nope. we no. don't want to amend it? Okay, so we're keeping with the motion for the principals. Um, any more discussion about the motion? All those in favor? Aye. 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 Saying aye. Uh, chair votes in the affirmative. I and abstained. Oh, I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I'm abstaining. I'm sorry. Uh, and Mr. Hainer abstained. Okay. And the last thing, and that is, um, we talked about this many times over the year, well, not many times, but several times about a late start. And uh, you have a, I've sent to you the recommendation uh, from the Middlesex League superintendents about looking at our, 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 our arrival time at the high school. Mm -hmm. And the, the thinking of the Middlesex League superintendents was that if we all got together and discussed this, one of the things that's always been an issue in this discussion is athletics. And by getting together and having unanimity on this, um, we have taken athletics out of the, out of the equation. Now, Right now, we have a lot here in Arlington on our plate, and in fact, we already have a start time, which is the lower end of the recommendation. But I would still like to have a discussion next year uh, about, about a start time. In Arlington, we actually would be in, um, would be less of a difficulty and a lot of changes for us, though this would be something we'd have to negotiate with the union and talk, there's a lot to this process, but in terms of obstacles, uh, physical obstacles like buses or lights on the field, we don't, we do not have those obstacles mm -hmm. like other districts. And that's why in this letter which you have, the recommendation was that there would not be implementation of it until 2018. Now there was one district, which is why the letter got out more quickly than it was anticipated. Um, the one I actually do the changes next year. So they're really on a fast track. And um, so I, I, I'll bring this back to you again next year when we have a little bit more time to do a thoughtful discussion and probably want to do it in subcommittee first. Yes. Mm -hmm. by, uh, by 2018, are you saying uh, <coughs> the 2017-18 school year or September 2018? September 2018. Okay. Mm -hmm. So two years out. Wow. And then, yeah. and oh, two years out from, from well, Do you have a sense of how late? No, 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 no. It, that, that's, no one well, two years out. This is going to be 16 September, yeah. and then it'll be two years. Because for some districts, they have, uh, they have uh, bus schedules and bus contracts. Mm -hmm. And for some districts, it would mean actually even changing the elementary start time. So there's a very much more complicated process for in, in other districts. Do you have any sense of how late the start time might gravitate toward? Well, I would like, I would see it going to, I would recommend thinking seriously about an 830 here mm -hmm. because we actually have a class here at the high school, a couple classes that start a period before. Mm -hmm. And so that means that they're here at 10 after 7 for, for band mm -hmm. or madrigals. And mm -hmm. so we have some, no, a, a significant number of students that are starting the day here at Arlington High School at 7, 10 in the morning and not at 8 o'clock. Yeah. Uh, Dr. Allison Abbey. Would we be looking at changing the middle school start time also? Well, I think that's part of the discussion. Um, I would say the two should be in tandem and partly because there, while we don't do, well, it'll be more complicated when you have two middle schools, but um, the we, we do do enough sharing and certainly there's the issue of our K-12 curriculum leaders. So it makes a lot of sense to have um, schedules that are at least start times that are very similar. And I just wanted to point out that um, there was a survey that went out to teachers and to parents and one of the questions was about this issue and it will be discussed in community relations as I understand. So, mm -hmm. And that's it. That's it for this mm -hmm. one. Okay, great. Um, so we're not too far behind. Consent agenda. Now I need to read this, right? Mm -hmm. yep. Um, all items listed with an asterisk are considered to be routine and will be enacted in, by one motion. There will be no separate discussion of these items unless a member of the committee so requests, in which event the item will be considered in its normal sequence. Approval of warrant. Warrant number 16145 dated March 24th, 2016. Total warrant amount is a uh, 
Approval of minutes, the Arlington School Committee regular meeting, March 24th, 2016. Approval of job description, special education coordinator out of district. Uh, I'd like. Dr. Asnanthi. Can, can we pull the um, special ed yes. coordinator? Is that what you're? That's exactly I, I what that. <laughs> Okay, so now by pulling that, do we vote? On the, the remainder. Yeah. Okay, so, so I just call the, <laughs> sorry. Call the vote. <laughs> okay. So all those in favor of the consent motion, or is that aye. how we do? Aye. aye. Okay. Aye. So we say aye. Uh, chair votes the affirmative, and now we will discuss the special education coordinator, Mr. Hainer. I have just two questions. Will this person be a AAA member? Yes, this person will be a AAA member. Will this person also be doing any evaluations? Yes. Okay. I saw and any of anything else. It wasn't listed as evaluations. Okay. Thank you. My, my questions were looking at the financial aspects of this. It looks like their, um, some of their work, to me, sounds like it overlaps with the business person who's already focusing on special ed, and I was wondering about that. Just uh, the coordinators, all the coordinators have a role in helping to form the budget each year, so this will just be uh, additional coordinators. A additional coordinator, so that's the other coordinators have those responsibilities. So it's not a duplication of, of it, stuff. It's not, and what we have currently in the budget for this year is 1.5 team chairs who handle out of district placements, and they are the team chairs are in the AEA. Mm -hmm. um, I have discussed um, this change with both Ms. Hansen and Ms. Ritz, who's the president of AAA, so they're aware of it and are. On board. What this would do is we would not replace, we would keep the 0.5 team chair, but not replace the 1.0. We had a retirement at the end of December of the 1.0 team chair, and we have replaced that person with an interim appointment for the rest of this year, someone who wouldn't return, and would replace that position with a coordinator. Okay, thank you. Uh, Mr. Hainer. The salary, I know, unlike the AEA, the AAA salary is, all, do you have a range? We have a formula now in the AAA okay. contract that uh, should, uh, is how apply. we determine the salary based Thank on you. education and, um, yeah. Thank you. Okay, so now we need to vote on this. On this. Okay. Um, move approval move, move of approval. the yeah, job I wasn't description. Sure. Okay, so move approval of... Um, the special education corner out of district um, position. Second. All those in, oh, seconded by Dr. Allison Ampey. All those in favor, please signify by saying aye. 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 All those uh, opposed or abstained? You're good? Okay. Um, and chair, chair um, is in the affirmative and it's an unanimous vote. Okay, so um, subcommittee liaison reports. And actually, I had a couple of things that I wanted to bring up. Uh, one is uh, the day in the hill is coming up mm -hmm. and I just want to encourage us all to think about things that we might want to bring to our legislatures and I remember last year there was a subcommittee discussion about that I don't know if we want to do that but just if it's, it's an op option open to us um, I know that I am going I know that uh, Ms. Starks is going Dr. Allison Ampey is going I can't you can't go and Mr. Slickman's going, um, so I don't know if there's anything we want to. I guess I guess if people are interested to direct issues, ideas to us. I have faith in you all. Yeah. Okay. <laughs> uh, the second thing I want to mention is this big thing about the calendar, and let me describe the problem. Um, you probably might know it. Um, so our next meeting has been usurped by the School Enrollment Task Force. And they, and, and right now on the calendar, we are only meeting for half an hour to do some small business, and then it's moving to a School Enrollment Task Force. Our meeting after that, on the 12th, we have a full meeting. Um, so this is uh, the, so let me see, go back. Um, School Enrollment Task Force is meeting on the 28th, they are then potentially voting on the second. Selectmen are potentially uh, voting to put um, something on the ballot for June 11th on the 6th. And then there's a feeling that if the vote Sixth is- 6th of May, it's Friday. Yeah, that was the, I mean, that's not finalized, but that was what- It would be on Fridays. Okay, uh, this is a, <laughs> this is a casual conversation with Dan Dunn 
I don't, they, they I don't think. They've done it before. I'm not sure. I, it's a, I think it's a quick thing. The idea was that they wanted to meet after the second. They need to find some time between the second and the seventh. That is their window. <laughs> because the seventh is 35 days before June 11th. Got it. So that's why they're doing that. Oh. Um, so um, if the decision is to repurpose Gibbs, we have a lot of work to do and a lot of discussion to do. Mm -hmm. But we're losing a meeting to do that, one of, one of the means that we could have been doing that. Um, and so the question is, do we want to add an additional meeting? Uh, the other thing that complicates thing, it, things is that potentially when the people advocating for the um, townwide vote go to the voters, they might want some information about what the school, school committee feels about the options. So one proposal is to add another meeting on the 19th of, of May. So, and here, here's, here's, the, here's the thinking. On the 12th of May, um, have the public come to us to talk to us about the middle school options, um, receive the superintendent recommendation. I mean, this is all prefaced on a vote by the selectmen, which hasn't been decided, or by the school, school enrollment task force, on if, if they do indeed vote to repurpose the gifts, which we don't, we don't know that vote yet. Um, so um, have the public come to us, have the superintendent come to us, we'll talk about it on the 12th, and then the 19th potentially meet to vote. Well, we can't we vote after well, we the 12th, have yeah. the meeting on the 12th? Yeah. Um, so Dan Dunn had this great view, <laughs> yeah, a personal mantra that uh, he makes no decision without a sleep and a shower. So it felt to me that we wouldn't be getting um, input from the superintendent or the public until that day, and that we might want some time to sort of mull it But over. why can we not get input on the 5th? Uh, the 5th, you mean have an earlier meeting. Yeah. So that's another possibility. We have a meeting on the 5th. We have no meeting. Oh, on I the have fifth. a meeting that's on the enrolled. fifth. No, I think that's no. Right. It says okay. school committee. So uh, we don't currently have a meeting on the fifth. So ah. that is a possibility. We could have an earlier meeting on the fifth. Um, clouding that is that there's a lot of stuff going on that week. There's the boys and girls club. There's you know, there's a um, town meeting, and it's going to be an exhausting Forever. week. I know it's, yes. it's going to be an exhausting mm -hmm. week. Um, first, uh, Mr. Kinlan. So I, I, w I wonder. Um, if we could do this, the uh, I wonder if, if Dr. Bodie could put together a, because right now we've been having a lot of conversations about the sixth grade versus the six, seven, and eight with all sorts of different information flying about, um, and a very good presentation by the teachers from their perspective, which is very, very useful and helpful. But I'm wondering if the superintendent could put together a plan for the sixth grade to the best of your ability with the information that you have, you know, this is gonna be the plan for the sixth grade. This is how it would work at the Gibbs School. And then, and then that's presented to the public and the committee at a certain point in time. I have not thought through, thought through the chronology, mm -hmm. but, but that would be sort of, we'd be looking at a concrete plan for the sixth grade. All the issues that have been raised will be addressed to the best of the superintendent's ability based on the information we have now. And I think that at some point, you know, a, a dead ex provided the Board of Selectmen vote to put this on the ballot right. on June 11th, a debt exclusion campaign begins and voters are going to want to know what am I voting on, mm -hmm. right? We, we talked about it at the Long Range Planning Committee, three questions, uh, one question with three, uh, funding three things. The feasibility study for the high school, which we can explain, the expansion of the Thompson Elementary School, which we can explain, mm -hmm. and then something for the middle school, mm -hmm. and to get people to vote uh, on that question, we need to give them enough information. Right. So I'm concerned about mm -hmm. putting us too far off into May, yep. and then trying to do a mini campaign in a couple of weeks. Yeah, no, this is a big, this is a big problem, right? Absolutely, um, Mr. Hammer. I think we, if Dr. Bodie can put that package together, we were just talking about, get it to us. We can have that meeting, and I, I'm comfortable of having material ahead of time. We'll have it ahead of time. I may hear something that may change my mind from the public that night. I doubt it very much, but I'd be, I think I'm comfortable voting that that night 
instead of putting it off another week or two weeks. I agree with Jeff. And uh, I have something I want to um, just to add to that but, at a later All right, so let's, campaign. Uh, Mr. Slickman. I mean, the thing is, is that uh, if the public wants input on this decision, uh, there's more than just a meeting to come to to talk right, to us. Right. They have the opportunity, and I think that they should, is to contact us by email. Um, you know, there are other forms that they can get information to us. And given the tight timeline, I would like to take that vote that night, if at all possible, unless something comes up that causes us to sit there and say, right. we need to think about this move forward. Because I, I'm looking at this, and, and the evidence seems to be conversion right. Right. for right. me. Right. And that, that's only my vote. Uh, how are we going to get to four votes or even a unanimous vote of the committee? I don't know. Uh, it, it's up to everybody else weighing it, but I think that by the time we get to that point, we'll have had sufficient time and notice for the community to start talking to us informally and to send us information so that uh, at that point we could make a decision coming out of that meeting. I would yeah, say May 12th mm -hmm. has to be the date that we take this vote. Mm -hmm. So I would sort of do like, uh, you know, backward design here. May 12th is the, is the assessment. That's the day we're going to take okay. the test. We're going to take the vote. Mm -hmm. So I would, the park. I would go, you know, go backwards from May 12th. And what are the things we have to do before May 12th to take the vote? That's so, right. So I, one of the things that I think is important. Uh, we, we, I mean, actually, we should include Dr. Boating this whole time. You're the one who's going to do all the work. Because we're, we're well, talking to you about doing all these things. So I, I don't know what you think. Well, actually, you already know what I think. Well, no, uh, but I mean, <laughs> in terms of the process. Yes, yeah. but the, in terms of the process, I was absolutely planning to do a recommendation. And the, the, I do think that there are some uh, financial things that we do need to talk about, and we can talk about it that night. For example, um, the, there's a replication of the special ed program. We need to talk about it, and we're going to talk about that and work on it. In fact, th that night you'll be presenting what the plan would be. But there's also the issue of if we're going to really have a different sixth grade do we want to have smaller clusters than we currently have? Mm. And that would mean <coughs> more incremental costs, which I actually didn't even put into my proposal. I'm going to go back and really look at this carefully. It also has implications for the usage of the buildings. When, when we did a floor plan for Gibbs, we've been able to identify 24 classrooms. Mm -hmm. And 16 were going to be for the core so it would mean rethinking really some things, too. I'm not sure that, honestly, by the 12th, that all would be taken care of, because the whole purpose of a design study is to do exactly that. And so I'm not sure how, how granulated you would want that, because I think there's some things we really need to, to talk about if we go that direction, what, well, how we want to design it. So uh, I just wanted to make some comment. I, from my perception, there's about 70% of the parents who actually don't know that this decision is imminent yet. And we have a lot of really engaged parents, so there is a question of how we want mm -hmm. to um, let those parents know that the decision is on, you know, the agenda. And so I think that's an. Uh, um, so, Dr. Alessandri. Okay. Yeah. First, just to clarify, the decision that you're talking mm -hmm. about is Gibbs six versus six eight. Yep. Okay. Yes. Prefaced mm -hmm. on okay. the, yes. to that effect right. by mm -hmm. the okay. task but just um. like, but being asked to give a plan and there's so there's this, some things around sixth grade. There's also some issues around six through eight mm -hmm. that that get into design as well. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. Then my other question is, if we didn't want to hold a full school committee meeting, would we want to? hash some of this stuff out in subcommittees, yeah. for example, talk about the, I'd really like to see how you're coming up with the financial, you know, the, the guesses for mm -hmm. the mm -hmm. estimates, just so I can talk about it right. to somebody mm -hmm. else. Mm -hmm. um, so that could be taken up by budget. Yep. Maybe curriculum would want to talk about the, edu more about we six did. versus. We did. Uh, we have a whole document on it. Mm -hmm. We already did that. Mm -hmm. And, and actually, those conversations can happen now, even though the final decision has been made. <coughs> yeah, right. That's why we had those. Yeah. Yeah. <coughs> okay, Mr. Thielen. So, uh, Kathy, what are you? Are, are you thinking that we would have a debt exclusion vote 
and not have resolved the sixth grade versus six through eight questions? Oh, no. No, no, we're no. talking about having no, no, to. No. We're just saying sure. when we're going to do that. Okay, so That's I'm it. Sure. The only question is when we're doing that. A detailed plan. Okay, yeah. okay, yeah. okay. So, 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 Dick, reframe what I said before. <clears throat> I mean, I, I, I think what I'm trying to say is the best plan you can come up with based oh, on your okay. so, so it's not okay. like it's, no. you know, the plan. Knowing, I mean, the it caveat will be that it's going to be The first be step in a, pl a, plan, yeah, a planful subject, approach to this. It's going to be subject to change, and uh, just like Needham's plan for the sixth grade has evolved ever, yes, over it the has. years, yeah. our, I, mean, I think you articulate frame it like ours is going to evolve too. Right. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, the best plan you can come up with, mm -hmm. I, and I, I personally think that, I don't know, May, it seems like to me May 12th is the last date the committee can take yeah. a vote on this, because you, you have, then you have you're just four weeks to yeah, it's, it's a four communicate week the whole thing okay. to the public. Okay. Yes, Mr. Hainer. My concern about May 12th, I agree with Mr. Thielman, that's the night we have to do the vote. If we have a lot of reports going on that night, it will imply to the public that we've already made up a decision, we're ignoring the reports. If we can get these reports and let the public know that we've had them in our hands, sufficient time to digest them ahead of time. That's all I'm asking. I have no, I have no problem sharing with the public that night. Well, what if, what if Dr. Bunny did a report? Uh, sometime before May 12th, I don't know what date. There's a public yep. hearing. Yep. Uh, where I that, yeah, yeah. That we might want to do that. I, I was yeah. thinking. Yeah, we might want to do that. Wanna, yeah. Sorry, sorry, Mr. Hamm. Yes. I, I moved that uh, we set May 5th, and that date's flexible with the committee, yeah. for a public hearing and Dr. Bodie making a report on that for that specific purpose. On okay. That May 5th, is which it, is, is a, that a Thursday. Um, we had talked about May 5th. As a school committee, yeah, I mean, we can figure out if, if that's well. The the purpose uh, you, you were asking for that school committee yeah. was to deal with this, wasn't uh, it? Yeah, actually. So my my concern is there's these competing pressures. One is we want the voters to know what the plan is, and they need to know that early on. And we also want the voters to know that we didn't take this decision lightly, and that we you know have been taking everybody's considerations into account, including educators, including the public, you know, and, and that we're really thinking about this and we're not coming to this lightly. So there's sort of a, you know, and not, those are not just perception. We want to do that in but fact. The, the, <laughs> the choice is either the 28th or the 5th the, or the tw or The 19th, the 12th, the 5th, right, those are the our well, sort I, of choices. I, what I would envision is the, the 5th is a public hearing. It could be a town okay. hall. It doesn't have to be a school committee meeting. The superintendent has a presentation of what yep. this sixth grade plan is going to look at. There's yep. teachers there and administrators, the principal okay. of the school, the middle school, the assistant principal, whoever wants, Jack Flood. They do a presentation on the sixth grade model, and then all the parents and members of the public in the room have an open forum with the superintendent yep. and us, too, asking questions. And that would be the May 5th, and that would be the, that would be and the vetting. And then we talk about it, yep. <laughs> and then May 12th, we take all that into account, and we take a vote. So is that, Dr. Bodie, is that timing, will that work for you? In sure. terms of, and will that, do you think that'll work for the teachers and administrators? That we'll I can't answer. We have to check the date. We have to check on the date. But that sounds like. But we also, excuse me. Sorry, sorry, sorry Mr. Bodie. But, but we have the documentation from the teachers. Yes. We have that, and we could, if, if they can't have, make it, we could still at least yeah. share that with the presentation yes. with those people. Yeah, but I mean, as a parent, it's very effective to see mm -hmm. an assistant principal up there saying, this is the best thing for your child, I'll tell you that. Mm -hmm. I mean. Okay, so there seems to be consensus to have a public meeting around the 5th and the decision around the 12th. Is there any, is, it, is there any sort of objection to that? Is there any sort of, I was, I was going to say the same thing to have it on the 5th. I would suggest mm -hmm. that we make sure it's scheduled as a school committee meeting in case there's any business yeah, right, that's coming right, yeah, up. That's on the 5th, right. okay. But it doesn't have to be here. It can be like no, a no, no. No, town no. hall. Are you free? Just exactly. We need. Mm -hmm. It's all Karen's fault. Okay. See, I knew there was going to Well, you have a shorter time potentially curve. on the. So far out of the curve, Cindy, it's not even playing. Okay. Um, <laughs> okay, great. Uh, we will make oh, that happen. Great. A school committee meeting. So. Okay. So then we have, now we have liaison, I mean, uh, subcommittee reports. Uh, said that committee. everyone has moved around. So how do we do that? Just call each committee and I'll see just call each committee and somebody who wants on no that one committee. Has a report. It's 940. I got, okay, I, I so got a biggie. <laughs> budget. I did budget, budget, yes. Last. I'm still she, budget. She's still budget. She's I'm still, still warm. Uh, we still should, budget. oh, I'm sorry. Yeah. Wait, wait, I'm, I'm sorry, I, I messed up. Um, we need to vote on. To to go have to oh, yeah. yeah. I'm right. second Mr. Hainer's motion to have the meeting on May 5th. On May 5th. Okay, sorry about that. Call the okay, vote. so all those in favor? Aye. 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 And chair votes aye. 
any we have to Who's say the time so the pl so the By policy sorry B6 so Let's is start. the motion to have a um, school committee slash public forum on the fifth at seven no I would, six thirty six thirty we usually have public forums on seven six thirty okay okay wait what's it six thirty uh, the on the fifth the public hearing. And where is it going to be? Town Hall. We, we, I think we have to find out if Town Hall is free. We don't know. We have we to don't know yet. We'd have to make that. It's either that or Karen's Who's front room. Who's planning this? Who's going to set I it up? Who's going to make all this The chair this and the superintendent. No yeah, we're, okay. I guess the two of us. Okay. Okay. Does that make sense? Okay. Okay. So okay. that was the motion. Um, all those in favor? Aye. 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 Saying aye. Chair votes in the affirmative. Um, so it's an unanimous motion. Uh, so now we have subcommittee reports. So. Budget, Dr. Allison Abbey. Okay, so budget. Um, budget, we had a meeting uh, at the end of the last year um, before we traded over to discuss putting a budget, a, a budget message in. Um, I was tasked with crafting that. However, I found in the process of doing this, I feel that our budget last year was a political statement. What we did, asking the town to fund more, throwing the whole thing at them, was a political statement. Um, in crafting this, there was some disagreement on wording and such, such to the point that I felt uncomfortable doing it without getting the approval of at least the subcommittee, I mean like a, a firm vote in a meeting. Um, and preferably of the full school committee. The problem was I hadn't allowed for that in the timeline and following in between the two terms um, made it kind of impossible to do. So there is no budget message from the budget subcommittee in the budget book because the time I couldn't get it in and you know, do all of that. Um, our options, one possibility is to write something and deliver it in conjunction with the book or after. Um, I felt a little, I don't know, I feel as a incoming town meeting member um, that that would have a weird feel to it. Mm -hmm. um, and so I'm not super in favor of that, but if ever, everyone else thinks it's a wonderful idea, I'm happy to work on it. Um, the idea of putting otherwise, on the chairs or we can just. Mm -hmm. <coughs> I mean, okay, Mr. We could talk at town meeting and explain things. Mr. Lippin. I'm not in favor of a separate statement on the seats. That, that just amplifies it to a certain extent where I, I think it would be appropriate statement if it was in the book, but to amplify it by putting it separately in the seats uh, I, I think is a little problematic. I mean, I, I think it's certainly legitimate for any of us, be, uh, be we town meeting members or not, we have the right to get up and speak our mind and right. discuss why we did what we did or how, wh how we voted in front of the meeting, and that would be an appropriate venue. And if the uh, esteemed budget chair would like to discuss some of the uh, uh, deliberations and the, and the feelings going into making this budget this year, I think that would be a, a good thing. Okay, great. Uh, Mr. Hainer, did you have something? No? Okay. Mm -hmm. Thank you. All right. Oh, okay, so okay. I'm not hearing a lot of movement for having this. But maybe you, you could actually, yeah, read it or talk about it. Well, yeah. I, I can do whatever I want. Mm -hmm. it, it was I was talking as the committee mm -hmm. that I'm not hearing a sense from the committee that we want to have mm -hmm. the committee make a message. No. And so next no. time, we'll, okay. mm -hmm. I still think that this is a useful and important mm -hmm. thing. Um, now I know that I think we'll just assume that we want to have the whole thing passed mm -hmm. so there isn't these quibbles about mm -hmm. wording and things like that. Okay, so Mr. Hainer had I, I just want to acknowledge, I read the draft that uh, Dr. Ampey put out and uh, I thought it was very powerful, it was very good. I'm sorry the timelines did not allow it for it to go in. Mm -hmm. I just want to make a public statement Thank on you. that. Mm -hmm. uh, so community rela relations. Do you want to talk about community relations? <laughs> <laughs> Your, it was yours. It was mine, but mm -hmm. I mean, at some point we'll have another meeting. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> so I, ca I can just say we. Um, Good report, Cindy. Ms. <laughs> 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 Anson and I. No, no. So, so I did an analysis of uh, the parents' response mm -hmm. with pie charts and stuff like that, and uh, Ms. Hanson did the calendar did, survey did, for the calendar survey. Sorry, for the calendar survey, and Ms. Hanson did an analysis. So hopefully that will go to to the community relations when it when yes. it next happens. 
and Linda, I know, uh, completed that same analysis for teachers. Yes. So we'll yes. try to mm -hmm. have a meeting and pull all that together and talk about it. Yeah. District accountability curriculum instruction uh, and uh, assessment. Did you have something? Before, I've got a question for community relations. Mm -hmm. Obviously, and unfortunately, it's a it's a broad political question, but um, I, I'm wondering if we have any administrators or conferences or tr field trips involving North Carolina or Mississippi, <laughs> and uh, wondering if community relations would want to inquire about that. I will send that to the community relations committee mm -hmm. to comply. Uh, the uh, anti. Yes, discrimination. But why, I, I don't I think mean, we have any. If if we don't, or do, or would we st have a statement that we're not predisposed to granting those trips? Do so we have any trips planned to Mississippi, no. North Carolina? Mm -hmm. That's a cut before well, the horse. Why, why why yeah. Let's deal with that when we get there. Send this to the community relations. Mm -hmm. They can put it on an agenda item. Yeah, that that then, was the question. Yeah, 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 uh, yeah. I'm not looking to get a vote out of this tonight, or or any time if if it's not going to come before us in a way, but, uh, but you know, I, I think that the, that this I community know. would want us to be firm in terms of mm -hmm. affirming the civil all rights right, of all. We will not be giving any concerts in North Carolina <laughs> or Mississippi. Mm -hmm. Okay. Go, go, go singing. Mm -hmm. oh, that does, I mean, our kids are, are so talented, they, right around. they go oh. across country. Yeah, so we do, we do Buy your gas right. in Virginia. Okay, um, district accountability, curriculum, instruction, assessment. Do anyone want to speak mm -hmm. to that? We met twice and all the materials were in the packet tonight. Right, mm -hmm. right. Uh, facilities. No report. We, the school enrollment task force meets on the 28th. Yeah. Mm -hmm. uh, policies and procedures. I have no report now, but it's my intent to harass the former chair and learn how he did it so well. <laughs> Try to emulate Former chair has no uh, uh, <laughs> obligation no. to help out anymore. <laughs> Okay, uh, school enrollment task force, anything that we haven't heard no. yet that we uh -oh. need to know? Okay, um, warrant committee. Everyone get paid again. Okay, excellent. Um, if I may just add one thing, I attended EDCO the other day. The entire meeting was on school calendars and the major topic was uh, religious holidays. Mm -hmm. I would like to share with the appropriate subcommittees, uh, Lexington I think has a way around our issues and uh, very positive, so. I think that's community relations. So I will. Community relations, I think, probably is this committee that everything gets dumped, right? <laughs> <laughs> that's how I found it. It used to be policy when I first came uh, <laughs> Maybe you can talk about this when you're avoiding North Carolina. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Good thing. Because they take every holiday. That's and how they avoid it. They take them all. Okay. A any other announcements? No? Okay. Um, so now we are moving to executive. So I need mm -hmm. to read this, right? Yep. Okay. Uh, we're going to executive session uh, to conduct strategy sessions in preparation for negotiating sessions with union and or non-union personnel mm -hmm. or contract negotiations with union and or non-union in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. To conduct strategy with respect to collective bargaining or litigation in which if held in an open meeting may have a detrimental effect. Collective bargaining may also be conducted. To discuss Arlington Educational Association Unit C negotiations and vote to approve the following executive session missions. That's the things we're, we'll be discussing in executive session. Uh, so we need a roll call to go into executive uh, session. Motion to Oh, sorry, motion, motion first? Yep. Motion to go in by Mr. Hayner, seconded by Ms. Starks. Okay, so uh, roll call. And, and oh, we sorry. will not return. Oh, and yes, to announce that we will not return from executive session. Thank you. Okay. Uh, roll call, um, Ms. Dr. Allison Amphi. Yes? I said aye. Oh, sorry. <laughs> Mr. Slipman? Yes. Okay, Ms. Starks? Yes. 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 Mr. Hayner? Mr. Thielen? Aye. And chair votes aye or yes, and we are in executive session. Thank you, Gail. So we will wait for the, oh, sorry. 